Deepak, we can wait for two, three minutes more. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. No problem. Deepak, I think we can start now. Sure, sir. I hope you can hear me, sir. Just, yeah, okay. Good evening. On behalf of IHERA and Jidus Pharma, I welcome you all. Sir, so you are muted. Yeah, Deepak, your screen is not visible. Not yet. How about now, sir? Allow me a moment. Let me know if, if I'm visible, if the screen is visible. No, no, not at Deepak. You want me to share? Mr. Deepak, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, well, you want me to share my, my screen? Let me try one last time and then I'll give it. Oh. Yes. Yeah, it is visible now. Please yes. go ahead. Yes. All right. All right. Good evening. I welcome you all on behalf of IHERA and Jidus Pharma to this wonderful webinar of today's Moving with Motion Dynamics of Sperm. For today's, for further proceedings, for today's, I would like to introduce four wonderful coordinators of today. Dr. Rahul Sain is currently working as Chief Clinical Embryologist in Nilkan Fertility, Jaipur, Rajasthan. He is Executive Member of ACE India and has been uh, in the field of ART since last 13 years. Dr. Sanket Dumal is working as Senior Clinical Embryologist at Shama IVF Fertility and Reproductive Medicine Center, 
He is a member of ACE and ASHRAE and Indian Science Pro Congress. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sanke. Dr. Paresh Makwana is Chief Embryologist, Center Head at Wings Group of Hospital, Ahmedabad, Gujarat, India, and other associated centers of Wings. Welcome, Dr. Paresh Makwana. And last but not the least, Dr. Akash Agarwal. He is a SRA certified clinical embryologist, scientific director, Hegde Fertility, Hyderabad. He is an alumnus of Osmania Medical College and a topper SRA clinical embryology, Vienna uh, 2019. I welcome all four uh, coordinators of today. And for the further proceedings, I would like to hand, the, uh, hand over the session to Dr. Sanket Dumar. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Deepak. Uh, so very good evening to all. On behalf of uh, Ihera, I'll be, I would like to welcome you all and uh, just start sharing my screen. Yeah, so uh, today we are here for the wonderful uh, webinar, which is on uh, mainly focused on the uh, dynamics of the spermatozoa. So it is like something like, you no, know, uh, we are not focusing on the dynamics, which is we are already involved during the since it's spermatogenesis. So mainly this webinar will be focusing on the dynamics of the spermatozoa post ejaculation. So we have three wonderful lectures, uh, one from Dr. Alejandro and second followed by, uh, by Dr. Sudipta Saha. And we have another lecture by Dr. Merig, followed by a very interesting panel on uh, uh, understanding the nature of the spermatozoa, that is the sperm selection. So now I would like to introduce uh, the moderators for the first uh, three lectures. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Vedh Prakash, sir, who is MSc PhD and the lab director at uh, Southern Fertility and IVF, Delhi NCR and is the president of uh, Academy of Clinical Embryology India, founder of International Human Embryology Research Academy, IHERA, and uh, member of Virtual Education Committee, uh, Society for, for the Study of Reproduction, SSR, and faculty in uh, fellowship in ERT program from MIT University, Noida, and visiting faculty at uh, uh, MSc in ERT from Mysore University. At, and he has contributed eight chapters in various textbooks and published papers in national and international journals. And his area of interest remains in IVF uh, to blastocyst formation and you know, innovation in embryo culture system. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Sanjay Shukla, sir. <clears throat> Dr. Sanjay Shukla, sir. So, he's a lab director at uh, Bahiti Hospital in Jaipur and uh, Shivani IVF and Fertility Center, Jaipur. So, sir has done his PhD in life sciences and worked as a, on the early diagnosis of uh, typhoid fever. And he's uh, working in the field of human reproduction since 1998. And he has fellowship in uh, biology of reproduction from uh, 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 Argentina. And uh, he is a current vice president for Academy of Clinical Immunologist India and a chairman for Academic Wing and also uh, 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 editor for the newsletter from ACE. And uh, welcome, sir. With that, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the first speaker of today's webinar, uh, Dr. Alexandro. Uh, Chavez Bariola. So he's a CEO at IVF 2.0, a company which is dedicated in bringing a new generation of technologies to the bench side with a very focus on the intersection of reproductive medicine and artificial intelligence. His current, current interest remain on SID, uh, used to AI to assist sperm selection for ICSI in real time, and uh, artificial intelligence evaluation of oocyte impact on embryo quality, that is AO and ERICA, which is Augmented Intelligence for Embryo Selection, and also Human Plus Artificial Intelligence to improve embryologist performance. And if you, uh, coming to his background, he has done his uh, UG from uh, 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 Academy Excellence Honors from Mexico in the year 1999. And he has done his PG in Obstetrics and Gynecology in Mexico in, in the year 2004. And he, he has been awarded highly skilled specialist uh, from British Council in the year 2005. And he has done reproductive medicine from the Liverpool Women's Hospital UK. And currently is working as a professor of gynecology at the uh, University of Pudularia. Uh, uh, Welcome, Dr. Alejandro. So the floor is Hello. yours. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and this uh, very kind presentation. So I'm, 
<clears throat> let me share my screen. And the title of, uh, of my talk is Sperm is no longer a beauty contest. Or in other words, how to improve sperm selection in, in real time. As it's already been uh, discussed, I have conflicts of interest. I am a founding partner of IVF 2.0, which is a company that developed and holds intellectual property rights for SEED, which is the AI that I will be discussing during the next few minutes. So I would like to begin with a bit of the history of IVF. Just by taking a look at the picture, it's very clear how much we have advanced since the late 80s when, when the first library was achieved in, in 78 in, in the UK. And if I had to ask 100 people, you have to remind that I, I am a clinician, okay? So if I had to ask 100 people involved in the IVF, uh, what they think that are the three greatest improvements in IVF since the birth of Lewis Brown, I believe that most would agree on the introduction of GnRH analogs for ovarian stimulation. Second, the introduction of transvaginal ultrasound guided egg retrieval. And third, the introduction of ICSI. Because in reality, ICSI is the first technology that could overcome or could help to overcome severe male infertility. ICSI has been so successful that we have now adapted it and we have found new uh, indications for it. For example, in some clinics, when they perform PGT, 100% of times they will use ICSI. When we attempt to fertilize frozen eggs, we use ICSI. And in some clinics, in some countries, like in the United States, there are some clinics which are using ICSI for 100% of their fertilization attempts, regardless on the fertility diagnosis. So it seems like ICSI has come a long way. But in reality, not much has changed since it was first described almost 30 years ago. Why is it that we are not paying more attention in sperm selection? Probably because we think that eggs are critical, which they are. <clears throat> probably because we think that most, probably we, we think that yeah, most of the responsibility for fertilization and normal embryo development will depend on the egg. And since most times we have plenty of sperm, then we just select whatever we think is best. But if we just stop for a minute and, we, and if we start thinking about eggs, eggs are the bottleneck in the IVF world. We don't have much choice of eggs. Even if I don't like an egg, I'm going to ask my embryologist to inject that, that egg and see what happens. And for embryos, we also have very little impact. The most that we can do is to prioritize the order in which we're going to transfer embryos, aiming to reduce time to pregnancy. But we're not changing the embryos. We're not improving community pregnancy rates. This means that the only real selection, the only one opportunity that we have to select from gametes is when we select sperm. Most of times we have many more sperm that we might need. Because of this, we even have most of times a luxury to reduce the population of sperm before we take a look at, at them under the microscope and immobilize one and inject it for, for the ICSI. But I wonder how many times we stop and think that from this potentially million sperm, we might be selecting one for these very few eggs available that will have an impact on fertilization, embryo development potential. And at the end, maybe characteristics of the individual, we cannot forget that the sperm is the one that is responsible for gender, for example. 
This is, I repeat, in other words, the one active decision we must make when selecting gametes. What do we have? We as humans understand our limits and we are very good at developing tools to help us overcome these limits. So the first thing that we have is the WHO manual that can help us to identify the best sperm available. We have developed techniques like smears to also help us identify different parts of the sperm structures and in this way identify which sperm have normal morphology. We have the, the uh, macular chamber to help us count the sperm and to identify motility. And these tools are okay, but they are not great. Why do I think this? Because these do not apply, cannot be used when we are selecting sperm for injection in real time. Once again, what do I mean by this? Just take a look at the subjectivity of the description of sperm morphology made by the WHO. The head should be, should be smooth. Now I'm 100% sure that what is going to be smooth for you might not be smooth for me. Or it's suggested that the acrosoma region should comprise 40 to 70% of the head area. That's very, very subjective. So are we really performing quantitative sperm selection? And this is when the sperm are immortal, like in this image. But try to select the best sperm from the morphological point of view now. Can you do it? And how about the speed? How about motility patterns? How many of the motility patterns that are described in the WHO manual can you identify simultaneously? And can you really identify which sperm is moving at about 25 micrometers per second? And which one is doing it at 27 or 24? Try to do it in real time. I'm not expecting you to actually be able to do that because we were not designed as humans to do it. And what is happening is that we're leaving our embryologists to make these decisions qualitatively when they have the sperm under the microscope. This is, they are making subjective decisions when selecting sperm. We made a very small uh, analysis to compare how embryologists at, at New Hope were selecting sperm. And what we, I'm, I'm talking about uh, consistency. We showed them uh, videos. And what we found is that practically they agreed on which sperm they would select in one out of every five or one out of every three cases. That's very, very bad consistency. And remember, they're all using the same tools. They have exactly the same uh, training and they have the same standards for selection as well, theoretically. So again, what can we do? Most of the work that has been done is to improve the ways in which we are reducing the number of sperm available for selection. This is, we're trying to improve the small population that is going to be left for us to check under the microscope. And this is why we have different techno techniques uh, for sperm capacitation and preparation, like the swim up gradients, new ones like microfluids, max, pixie. And probably the only one that can help us in real time because again, the previous ones are just improving the population, but at the end are leaving the embryologist on its own to select under the microscope from amongst many sperm. IMC is probably the only one that in real time is helping to improve the selection of sperm uh, based on morphology. But <clears throat> for whomever has tried to do IMC or the super ICSI, as they like to call it in Brazil, uh, the digital magnification is so dramatic that if you have sperm with normal motility and you have many sperm, it's almost impossible to track them. So once again, we're leaving our embryologists on their own to make decisions by themselves under the microscope. 
But once again, we humans are very good at developing tools to improve ourselves, provided we recognize our limits. My eyes, my, my brain, have not been designed to measure volumes, for example. I haven't been designed to accurately assess temperature or altitude or to assess how much petrol my car has left. But again, we have developed tools that can help us reach our goals. Can we do this for sperm selection? Try and select one sperm from this sample. I know that they are moving faster than usual, but can we do better than we are currently doing? The answer is yes, we believe we can. And this is how we develop SEED. SEED is a computer vision and AI software that is able to identify every single sperm under the a microscopy field, track them individually, in real time, extract patterns that we have linked to normal fertilization and blastocyst formation and to pinpoint this sperm so the embryologists have the luxury to select uh, sperms that are being assessed quantitatively. So how did we develop seed? How did we train seed? We got a series of videos from uh, several collaborators. We extract uh, all the patterns from the sperm that they had selected. We asked them to follow through fertilization, blastocyst formation, and then we compare those patterns that were linked uh, positively with the desired outcomes. Again, we define the desired outcomes as normal fertilization. This is 2PN formation and blastocyst formation. The first uh, proof of concept after a proof of principle that we developed uh, at New Hope Fertility Center in Mexico in collaboration with them. We got another collaborator that uh, sent us 84 ICSI procedures where a total of 220 sperm were analyzed. And what we found is that there was a difference between those sperm that were selected by the embryologist in comparison against those that were not selected, in particular, uh, linear velocity. Then when we checked for normal fertilization, we again uh, confirmed that there were some motility patterns that were linked to positive uh, normal fertilization. And the same happened again when we checked for blastocyst formation. In particular, HMP, which you won't find in the uh, WH man uh, o manual, is a head movement pattern that we identified uh, through SEED. We decided to develop a score, the SEED score. And after going through all these videos, we found that the SEED score was positively correlated with normal fertilization, but probably because of the size of the sample, we haven't been able to link uh, the seed score with blastocyst formation. Of course, this was a very small number. We increased the numbers, we increased the number of clinics that are collaborating with us. And so far, we have assessed just under 500 ICSI uh, videos. In total, over 9,000 sperm have been assessed by seed. And what we have found is similar to the previous uh, results. There are some motility patterns that are preferred by embryologists, but as you can see, clinic one, clinic two, clinic three, they all seem to have different things that each of them like, except for linear velocity that everyone seems to, to select. But for fertilization and blastocyst formation, again, HMP seems to be a very relevant a pattern. Where are we today? Well, we believe that we must stop approaching sperm selection for ICSI as a qualitative assessment. This should become a quantitative approach. And before I, I jump into conclusions, uh, again, uh, where are we in the clinic? 
we have already used uh, seed for clinical cases since November last year. We have confirmed ongoing pregnancies in two clinics now, and we are just about to engage in a multi-centered perspective uh, sibling oocyte study. We, of course, are aware that we are raising a lot of new questions. And the first one is, does normal, what is being described as normal, equals as optimal? Is the normal sperm the one that is going to give us the best chance of a healthy embryo? Well, we don't know yet, of course, but uh, these are the questions that we expect to, to answer soon. In conclusion, as I was telling you, we expect that sperm selection for ICSI can now become a quantitative sperm assessment. For us, success is being as good as a very good senior embryologist. Because what we intend is to augment the, capabi the capabilities of the embryologist. We're not expecting to substitute embryologists. Again, this is only a tool, and tools tend to make us better. So we expect to augment capabilities of embryologists to improve and standardize the process of sperm selection. And of course, again, we expect to learn a lot, a lot from seed. We might end up learning that there are some morphology, motility patterns that, if present, will be detrimental. So it's not only about what is there, but making sure that there are some things that are not there. So this is uh, pretty much uh, where we are. I want to thank all the people that have been supporting us, uh, all the team of IVF 2.0, Gerardo, Adolfo, Roberto, the team at Boston IVF, in particular, Denis Sacas and uh, Anokayo Cali, New Hope Fertility Centers in Mexico, New York, IOLS in, in Greece, Aria in London, and uh, the Opera Egypt uh, Network in Egypt, and of course, the University of Kent. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alejandro. Uh, I heard you last year, and it was a mesmerizing talk. And, uh, Thank you. Truly overwhelming. Uh, I have a few very basic questions. Uh, do we need some specific uh, optics for this? No, the only thing that is needed is a digital camera to, to be attached to to the microscope, to the inverted microscope, where, where usually the X is performed. That's all. Okay. Uh, no special magnification? No special magnification. Uh, since SEED is also working with deep learning, it can automatically uh, understand some changes. We have used it with 20, 40X, and it also works with 7%, 10% uh, PVP, no PVP, uh, slow sperm at the end, it's also providing a ranking. So it will identify the motility patterns that are best for that specific sample. So any camera will do. Perfect. Um, so related to this, uh, yeah, I'm wondering, I mean, you have already uh, spoken about this, that you are working in this direction uh, about the quantitative assessment. Uh, so can we expect that in uh, coming days, uh, we may incorporate SID score in our routine semen analysis? Mm, semen analysis has, I believe, a different objective. Mainly is aimed to identify those men with which will have fertility problems. And CD is designed specifically for sperm selection. And the thing is that if you have a patient that has a very, very bad sample, but few good sperm, that might be enough. And if we are able to identify these few sperm, we might be able to offer them, this couple, the same chances of having top quality blastocyst as another couple with million sperm that has also many, many healthy sperm. And hopefully at some point, these 
individual that has a very poor sample with few top quality sperm might end up having a better chance when using seed in comparison to an individual with a very good sample uh, where the sperm was identified and selected uh, qualitatively and unfortunately poor sperm was selected. Because why I asked you this question is because there are many people out there, um, old school people like me, who still um, wants to perform IVF or even IUI, uh, not just IC. So if we can have some information, uh, uh, some prognostic information from the, the semen analysis using your application, it would be great that we can decide on whether we should go for uh, directly for ICSI or we can still perform IVF or conventional IVF or IUI. Oh, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, I, one of the KPI indicators for our lab is the rate of ICSI. Mm -hmm. And we prefer to keep ICSI to the bare minimum possible. At the end, this is an invasive procedure, even if yeah. minimally invasive is, is invasive. And I approach ICSI as surgery. And I avoid surgery unless it's strictly necessary because when you take a patient to theater, it doesn't matter how good you are. There are always risks. So if the risks are not going to outweigh the benefits, then I prefer not to, to perform a procedure. And this is the case of ICSI. So I completely agree with you. Uh, here we have one question. I, I could not get it perfectly, but let me read it out for you. Uh, some uh, Dr. Saras Saraswati asks, can we add our own cutoffs in the software or it will be having its own unchangeable criteria? I mean, uh, you have certain criteria for this and is it customizable? Yes. And uh, one of the beauties of this technology is that since it learns, you will learn from the whole data set, but it will also learn specific conditions about individual clinics. And I'll use uh, the case of Erika, our embryo ranking uh, AI system. When we introduce Erika into a clinic for the first time, there are two things that must happen for a clinic to be successful at using this technology, again, is, is a tool. If you hand me a Formula One car, I will crash it to the corner because I don't know how to drive it. So we need to learn how to use it. And in the same way, the AI needs to learn from your clinic. It can imagine that Erika has been exposed to 50 million embryos, but then you introduce it to a clinic that is using embryoscope for the first time. This is a completely different world for Erika. We have to train Erika with specific conditions about this clinic. It will learn very, very quick, and then it will become better and better. So to answer this question, we already have a very strong core for seed for Erika that is going to be used to transfer its learning into new uh, labs. And it will learn from specific conditions. And this is not a problem that seed or Erika have. This is a problem that Google has. This is a problem that Tesla has. This is one of the reasons why there are no uh, fully automated cars driving in the streets because of the risk of under specifications. There are so many examples possible in the world that anything that the computers cannot see, we're risking that they cannot understand it. A good AI should generalize and should understand and should perform very well. But the more we learn about specific conditions from a clinic, the better it will perform. So in brief, yes, we have a preset that is based on all that Seed and Erika have learned from many, many clinics, many, many cases, but it will further fine tune from individual clinics. So uh, I guess uh, most of the people, they understand that your this uh, from selection is basically uh, based on the, 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 uh, the data set that you are getting from the, uh, the study of motility. Uh, but can it also be applied to immotile sperms like TESA sperms or MESA sperms or PESA sperms? Not at this moment. Uh, 
one of the things that we are working on is to identify areas of interest where there is a high chance uh, for embryologists to find sperm. But seed is based mainly on motility patterns. And I know it sounds like a very bad example. I use it all the time, but <clears throat> it's very graphic, so sorry. Imagine you have a dog that has three legs. You don't have to be a genius to predict that this dog is going to have an abnormal motility pattern just because it has a morphological problem. So the sperm, they don't exist, but if you have a sperm with a square head, the hydrodynamics around this won't be the same as a sperm with a normal shape. So uh, probably, it wasn't identifiable in one of the videos that I showed that was blue, green, yellow, red. Uh, it looked like this uh, thermal vision. It's not thermal. What is the computer is doing is identifying how the fluid around the sperm is getting displaced by the sperm. So it's not identifying the sperm movement just by looking at the sperm, but also the fluid around it. So we expect that when we can reconstruct in real time, we'll be a, uh, able to identify morphology, maybe even better than with uh, stains. So it's not just the it's not motility, but the hydrodynamics or the fluid dynamics that you are studying. Yes. So you, may, you mean to say that uh, uh, using SID, we can correlate the uh, morphology also with the movement motility. Well, at this point, we believe that motility is highly correlated and dependent on morphology. And that the best way to assess the sperm in a more integral way is movement, because that will uh, practically lead us to include about membrane integrity, vitality, and I know that some uh, live sperm don't move, but uh, it's vitality and hope morphology, and we hope also uh, perhaps even DNA integrity. But this point is mainly based on motility. Okay. Right, right. Wow, so. Uh, I think it is wonderful, excellent lecture. And uh, I hope everybody has enjoyed. And uh, Dr. Shuklaji asked so many uh, good questions. And uh, uh, really, really, it is an uh, excellent lecture. We all enjoyed, I think. Sir, yeah, I, I have one question, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. please. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the it was, uh, so first of all, congratulations on your, the very first pregnancy by Sid. That was just the last month ago. So, uh, so basically, you're focusing on the blastocyst formation rate, right? If you consider the hypothesis, the primary outcome will be the blastocyst formation rates. Won't it be like a, you know, uh, which provides you partial information because the primary outcome should be uh, either clinical pregnancy rates or take home baby rates? Give me one second. And I hope uh, to be able to to show you in a more graphical way. Mm -mm -mm. Just one second, please. Please, please, please. I'm looking for, for one specific slide. Okay, here it goes. Can you tell me how many margaritas were sold the day after this picture was taken? No one can tell me. It is difficult for me. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. No one can tell. And your guess is going to be as good as mine or as good as the computers. And the reason why is because in this picture, you cannot say whether this was high season, low season, whether this picture was taken in a very populated resort or in a desert island. This is, right. the computer cannot 
identify what it cannot see. And since you are showing to the computer motile sperm, the computer is not looking at the egg that is going to be fertilized. It's not looking at the endometrium. It doesn't know if the implantation window is okay. And again, I've, I've told you before, I'm a clinician, we're perfect. We always perform 100% of our transfers are perfect. But every now and then, we mess up the transfers. So who is going to be performing the, performing the transfer? And <clears throat> do you want to go to the point of live birth? How can you anticipate whether this patient is going to develop gestational diabetes, hypertension associated with pregnancy? And it, looks it's, it will sound horrible, but how can you predict that this patient is not going to have a car crash and the baby won't be born ever? So we have to keep realistic with the expectations that we have on AI. So in brief, blastocyst information at this point is what we think is the most realistic outcome that we can measure. Implantation is well beyond our target, but you're right in one thing, miscarriage. What we're currently studying is once, once that we have a positive pregnancy test, we know that at the very least, the transfer was okay and the implantation window was okay. So is there any correlation between sperm patterns and early miscarriage? But of course, we need a huge number of cycles, huge number of transfers, and this is going to be a long, long study before we, we get results, but we're looking into miscarriage. The one thing, uh, the one reason why I'm being so dramatic about this is because if we don't keep our expectations under control, what will end up happening with any AI and many new technologies that will come along is exactly the same as what is happening nowadays with PGT. PGT, now, it seems like a fashion to write a new article saying that PGT doesn't work because it doesn't increase cumulative pregnancy rates. Of course, it's not going to increase cumulative pregnancy rates because it's not modifying the embryo. Yes, I don't I... think that the, that the goal of PGT was to improve cumulative pregnancy rates, but to reduce time to a live birth. To deselect the embryos, mainly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alejandro. It was a wonderful listening to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, with that note, uh, that we are, with said, we are looking only the 50% counterpart of the, the contribution, uh, what is going to happen for the uh, live birth. Uh, well, uh, taking forward the session, I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker. So it's uh, Dr. Sudipta Saha. So Sarah has been assistant professor of uh, level three at Amity Institute of Physiology and Allied Sciences. And um, he's, he's, assistant, uh, he's uh, done CSR Central School Professor Officer at uh, IICB Kolkata, India from November 2015 to 2017. And he has done his postdoctoral research as associate in CSIR IICB at uh, 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 Changwang University, Taiwan from November 20, 2009 to April 2015. And he has done his PhD in life sciences in the year 2008 by CSR in uh, Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, uh, Jadavpur University, Kolkata, India. And he has done his master's and bachelor's in physiology from uh, uh, City College and Presidency College, Institute of Calcutta, India. And uh, he has been uh, a recipient of uh, uh, various funded projects, including DHT SERP, SRG. And he has published uh, uh, numerous uh, publications in national and international journals. And he's contributed uh, book chapters and interview articles and ebooks, and he has been this, uh, patent. He, has, he wants a patent for uh, one of the thing, which is uh, again from the uh, uh, study which has been funded, and uh, he's been life membership of uh, Society of Biological Sciences, Biological Chemists, India, and Indian Science uh, Congress Association, and his uh, area of interest remains reproductive biology, cell biology, and uh, bioinstrumentation. Welcome, sir. Over to you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sanket. Uh, so a very uh, good evening to everybody at IHERA and all the audience. So after the fascinating lecture by Dr. Alessandro, I would like to mention, uh, I am not a so-called embryologist. I am rather a, a reproductive biologist or other sperm biologist uh, or a cell biologist who works on sperm. And uh, my intention is more to uh, create good quality sperm and I'll help the help human beings to create good quality sperms uh, um, and like uh, obviously I, I obviously agree that uh, intrauterine insemination and like in vitro fertilization and ICSI helping millions of people around the world but uh, it had its disadvantages and side effects. So uh, I'll be more speaking, uh, although Dr. Sanket has told in the very beginning that we are talking about the cells after ejaculation, right? Uh, but actually the training of the sperm cells to move that takes place before ejaculation. Uh, so I am, um, I'll more speak about things before ejaculation uh, inside, the, inside the testicles. And uh, okay, some of the things are obviously that may be related after post uh, ejaculation. Okay, so let me just share my slide. Okay, uh, is it visible, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so uh, I would I would not uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sanket has already introduced me so I'll just directly going into the topic. So I as as he said I am from IICB Kolkata and my my supervisor was one of the best reproductive biologists or sperm biologists rather of India Dr. G C Majumdar. Uh, so presently I'm in Amity and this is my lab and it was inaugurated just a few months back. Because it's a new lab, and uh, it's we have named it as Molecular Reproductive Physiology Laboratory, and uh, our major research interest. Uh, there are various research interests we have, like starting from extracellular factors to various sperm surface molecules. It can be proteins, it can be lipids, it can be uh, metal ions, and also. Uh, like there are fields of sperm cryopreservation and also motility assay. Uh, as uh, during introducing myself, Dr. Sanket has said that bioinstrumentation is also one of my uh, research interests. So presently, uh, my lab, we are working on a protein called motility stimulating protein. And also another student of mine, uh, she wants to work on uh, fatty acids uh, uh, on the membrane and and conjugated with calcium, how it works. And my another interest is vertical velocity analyzer. Okay. Very recently, this uh, uh, review article was uh, published in, in Middle East uh, Fertility Society Journal. And from there, like uh, we have uh, discussed all about sperm mortality uh, promotion and uh, certain mechanisms and etc. So basically in this particular review article, we talked about the importance of motility, asthenospermia, maturation in the pyridimis, and the role of calcium and bicarbonate, um, ROS, pH, and a little bit about ART, and obviously uh, about the sperm surface uh, molecules. So uh, basically, if you see the international scenario, you will find there are uh, like thousands of research lab working on various diseases, uh, cancer, this, that, whatever, on various mechanisms and all. But you will find very few labs are working on reproductive biology. And even if somebody is working on reproductive biology, maximum working on uh, the sperm uh, like fertilization and beyond or on the ovum part. But sperm is kind of neglected. That's why we kind of select sperm on their morphology, on their speed, that's it. And we don't try to modulate it much or try to do some research which will help us in getting a better sperm directly from the, from the, from the person and, and the fertilization can happen uh, normally. Uh, so as you can see, I just take this and took this screenshot for you that uh, you can see the citation scores given by Scopus 
So all the different like nature and like chemical reviews, Lancet, et cetera, have so high citation scores, but you see fertility, sterility, human reproduction update and human reproduction, they are citation scores. So you can understand it's a very, very, very narrow field. And out of that sperm research is very, very low. So basic research on spermatozoa is the need of the time that many people should come up and work on spermatozoa so that we can have more healthy sperm directly. Uh, so obviously these are all um, um, talked about like, you know, uh, according to WHO infertility and it can, it was failure to achieve pregnancy 12 months or longer and eight to 12 percent couples face the problems uh, associated to infertility and 50 percent contributed by males 50 percent by females and 12 to 18 million couples in india are diagnosed with infertility every year so the problem is big but the amount of research is very very less and mostly sperm um, or infertility related factors male infertility related factors they are like low sperm production or abnormal sperm function or motility. So basically diagnosis is mostly the maximum part is idiopathic. It is not known, the reason is not known. And a little bit, uh, uh, so you can see on the chart itself, a little bit due to varicocele, a little bit about other causes. So mainly unexplained. Uh, so there are various, various reasons for uh, the sperm mortality to reduce. It can be from, uh, from pollution to lifestyle, to like uh, um, hormonal disruption, to genetic defects and any different kinds of uh, things that can happen to the cause the male infertility or to cause the sperm to move uh, less or not at all. So as the Zeus for me, obviously there is, uh, we don't have either if we have less motility or no motility at all, and sperm cells are transcriptionally and translationally obviously inactive. So we have to do something when it is getting maturing, when it is maturing, we'll do something at that stage. Uh, uh, and there are specific uh, metabolic pathways that regulate the ability of the, uh, of the sperm, uh, regulate the ability of the sperm to uh, fertilize the ovum. So sperm motility is regulated by several signaling cascade mechanisms like cyclic AMP related, protein kinase A related pathways or phosphorin acid uh, signaling pathways and also calcium bicarbonate, that is the pH. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think there was, I think we put on a small video over here that the sperm cells that are not moving, etc. Anyway, doesn't matter. So, let us just put it forward, yeah. So basically, as I was telling at the very beginning, the training school or the epididymis is the main, should be the main target of basic researchers who would like to work on spermatozoa. Because in epididymis, the caput, corpus, and the corda part, all, you know, they are uh, like uh, expressing different genes and different proteins and different proteins are coming on the sperm membrane, inhibitors, activators, both. And they are leaving the sperm membrane at various phases. If you look at the review article or our previous review articles also, you'll find that various proteins are coming in, various proteins are going away, and the epididymis itself also express different sets of uh, proteins. And not only it expresses, but also proteins coming from the blood itself also. So this region specific gene expression, all these things uh, should be targeted to understand the motility of a cell that how can we modulate, how can we take care of it so that people don't become infertile. So in the, in the epididymis, you can see there are several uh, proteins uh, like uh, metalloproteases and et cetera. Uh, they, uh, they kind of expressed and they help out uh, I mean, in um, um, reducing the, uh, the sperm, uh, like um, agglutination or attachment, and also like it can break, uh, break down certain proteins, which uh, uh, and cause these problems. And uh, so in, in general, uh, the, the, the spermatozoa structure, if you look at, look, look at you'll find like uh, there can be, there are basically certain parts, the head part, mostly responsible for the spermic interaction, the neck part or the mitochondrial part is responsible for the energy production and the tail part is the motor that actually propels it forward. 
So the architecture inside, uh, considering this nine plus two dining structure and etc., we I would like to say that you know se several uh, several several uh, gene expressions, uh, if if they are defective, and that will cause the axonomal structure to remain uh, like. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, it will show reduced motility, and sometimes it will some some proteins if they are not uh, not uh, expressed properly, there will absence of inner dynamism and no motility at all. Or sometimes the structure will be all uh, all good, but the central uh, complex the now uh, will maybe maybe uh, affected. So several genes they should be expressed properly. If there is any trouble happening over there. Which is causing the sperm to move, move less should be uh, uh, more researched upon. So the basic uh, idea for uh, uh, having a good, um, a good sperm motility is that we need to have um, higher pH happening inside, and we've got to have more calcium coming inside. Uh, actually, that will kind of activate the 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 soluble adrenaline cyclase and thereby forming more cyclic AMP and that will cause more increase in pH, increase calcium, which will cause the hyperactivation uh, like uh, cyclic AMP through the protein kinase A obviously and thereby helping in the process of uh, sperm motility. So all these channel proteins, all these carrier proteins, they should be looked upon whether there is some problem happening, some protein expression levels and et cetera. So something can be done to that so that these things uh, does not happen. So calcium is a very, very vital um, uh, uh, thing to in, in for motility because you know if calcium goes down, capacitation, uh, total uh, ATP, steroidogenesis, chemotaxis, exogenation, everything goes down and that can cause uh, male infertility. I would refer to one of our publications um, uh, uh, that says the optimum calcium concentration where we found that calcium has a biphasic role in sperm motility at to a certain level it will increase motility then it will decrease motility and we have tried to prove it with, um, with chelation by chelating the, the um, thing and also by resupplementation of calcium we have seen the motility has increased again so we have seen the the importance of motility and the importance of the quantity of calcium and the optimum quantity of calcium also we have sort of tried to review the reactive oxygen species and we found out that free radicals uh, they are byproducts of the metabolic processes and like obviously uh, all the pollution and all the stress that are on throughout and this uh, basically hinders to the, to the sperm motility but we have to keep in mind that reactive oxygen species have you know they are required in small quantity for the capacitation acrosome reaction and, and the motility obviously so the optimum level has to be maintained so so it has to be looked at the analysis has to be done more on these things uh, in the perspective of sperm biology not in not in general cell biology but in, in the perspective of sperm biology we have to look at it also, pH is so very important. We have just now said and saw the, the pathways and etc. So in the various stages of the sperm maturation and also going through the female reproductive tract, the pH varies in its own way. Like it is, it is initially alkaline, then it goes a little bit drops and then again comes back to alkaline. And then it goes into the vagina, it falls up into an acidic region and then proceeds further and uh, then gets uh, alkaline again. So uh, obviously this uh, nice uh, pH distribution has been met for the sorting of spermatozoa, obviously, but uh, we have to take care and see if there is some alteration happening in the pH uh, in, the, in, the, in various stages to that so that we can take care of that. Uh, so anyway, these are just uh, biodemographic data that are, are given here. I'm not just talking about them, the semen volume and et cetera, the normal volumes, et cetera, that are recommended by WHO. So, so now let us come little to a little bit about the instruments, the best instruments available for sperm motility determination, is obviously computer aided semen analyzer, which measures individual cells uh, and their velocities, uh, uh, but these velocities are all horizontal velocities. We have uh, a few years back um, devised an instrument which can measure the velocity of spermatozoa 
in the vertical direction. So this is the publication. And this instrument, as you can see over here, uh, has been patented. Uh, this concept has been patented. And this instrument can measure the velocity of spermatozoa in the vertical direction. It's a very spectrophotometric, a spectrophotometric instrument, uh, which is very cost effective, rather very low cost, you can say, in comparison to CASA and etc. Here, it does not measure uh, motility uh, of single cell or a group of, but it measures the motility of a group of cells or a bunch of cells. And we can still work on this particular instrument to make it more, more fine uh, and make it more effective for maybe for individual cell selection and etc. Because vertical velocity that is moving movement against the gravity is always very difficult and that will grade the sperm cells in a much better way, which I kind of tried to express with this cartoon, where in the spectrophotometric system in the cubit, the cells that are coming up first uh, on the top of top layer. That, that is why in IVF, probably uh, all you embryologists take up the swim up cells. So we hope that bunch of cells will be the best cell for the, for the fertilization. So we can measure the velocity um, uh, quantitatively and thereby can use it not only in, uh, not only in IVF, but also in, uh, in uh, fertilization or IUI of animals and poultry and whatever, wherever possible or in conservation of species also. So uh, ART, artificial reproductive technology, obviously has its own drawbacks because you know the person or the patients have to go through so much, so much of uh, hormone treatment. And you know there is an ordeal, and there, is, I mean, there are chances of failures. So uh, and it is expensive also for many people, at least in countries like, uh, like ours. So in that case, uh, we must try to find out solutions which will uh, not take them to uh, ART or people who cannot afford ART, they can still uh, gain, I mean, uh, gain fertility by some kind of a treatment. So those uh, um, researches should be done. The other study that I would like to just highlight upon quickly is the sperm surface molecules. So there are several uh, lipid molecules uh, that can be studied upon. There are protein molecules which kind of uh, either cyclic MP dependent or independently it is causing increment of sperm uh, motility. Uh, they have to be looked upon. There are calcium, there are copper, uh, copper uh, um, 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 related or magnesium related motility increment. So they have to be looked upon. And uh, there are uh, more, there is a motility stimulating protein. We uh, there are several proteins on the sperm membrane. Uh, out of which there is there are anti-sticking factors. There are inhibitory proteins. There are initiating proteins. So uh, this is one of my papers which where we, uh, I spoke about uh, the the motility uh, promoting protein and we we found it from goat blood serum. But it's this is a species non-specific protein which can enhance the the motility of spermatozoa to a very high extent and we have uh, found out the motility through CASA as well as through our own instrument and that is in the right panel you can see the the hand in hand we have seen together uh, for this actually I had to take my instrument to CCMB to Dr. Shivaji's lab in, in CCMB uh, many years a few years back uh, so this particular protein uh, actually you know there are known motility promoters like like uh, the phosphodiester inhibitors like theophylline or bicarbonate, they increase the motility of spermatozoa, but they have a little bit elongated uh, incubation period. But this protein enhances the motility instantly within 30 seconds to one minute, and it maintains the motility to a very long time. I mean, in the, the, the incubation period is quick, and it can also store the spermatozoa and it stored the motility uh, of the spermatozoa for a very long time. You can see in the right panel, till up to three hours, it maintained the motility. I mean, it dropped obviously a little bit, but uh, it, it maintained the upper the upper curve that you can see. It maintained the motility for a very very long time. So there are such amazing proteins available, and we need to uh, work on these proteins to find out how they work. We have seen this protein um, uh, is found all over the cell. This is a general fluorescent microscopy that we had done. And we have also seen the antibody of this protein can reduce the motility 
and uh, a higher dose will cause agglutination obviously so we have tried to do a papain digested mono, uh, monovalent antibody and we tried to treat it and it still caused uh, a reduction in mortality so this protein is obviously very important for the motility of the spermatozoa uh, but you may ask that why the motility has not gone, gone down to zero in the papain digested antibody so this is one of the factors that causes motility or increases motility but it is not the only factor that uh, increases motility this is unpublished data i just wanted to show you uh, where it shows from kappa to corpus to corda this particular protein it gradually goes to the top of the to the acrosomal region so we have seen it uh, it's still a lot of work has to be done on this before publication and uh, like just uh, we have done, we have a little bit seen on an ejaculatory spermatozoa also that it is found on the top on the on the acrosomal region so uh, and through elisa we also found that the levels of this particular protein truly increases as you take the membrane from the kappa corpus and quarta so we have seen that uh, also and uh, so basically uh, uh, for, uh, like uh, it is not only that we uh, we should look at the the the, the movement and the and the looks of the spermatozoa but we need to have uh, uh, some some kind of a research going on which which will help us in um, helping people to get a better spermatozoa uh, directly from the person and uh, so that and also work has to be done more on calcium on the ph and on the reactive oxygen species uh, uh, and the antioxidants and how all the stress factors all the all the other um, uh, factors that are causing to reduce this, the reduce mortality uh, can be negated uh, so this uh, utilizing this uh, we, uh, mortality in using proteins and other surface molecules and uh, maybe reducing the uh, hormonal treatments. And so this will help us tackle the infertility problem um, more effectively if the surface molecules and other molecules, related molecules are researched upon. So uh, thereby, I would like to uh, finish my lecture. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to uh, give a presentation in this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudipa. Actually, it was an excellent lecture. Actually, uh, it uh, uh, took us basics uh, 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 biology of his thumb, and uh, really uh, we enjoyed that lecture. So, as you mentioned, three, four points uh, mainly like uh, calcium and ROS and other things, uh, uh, other molecules. So, here I want to ask about only one part, uh, question to you that uh, is there any cut off value of calcium in seminal plasma so mm -hmm. we can make out that uh, that how uh, better is sample is yeah i mean if you if you if you yeah, exactly so if you see the this paper that i showed you on screen you know uh, i think it was uh, 10 millimolar calcium i think it is giving it is giving the best mortality and if it goes beyond that it is kind of dropping immediately so uh, if this particular paper if you see we have tried it so many times to confirm it so yeah there is a cutoff value i mean it, it, because it is biphasic if you increase it by a little bit it will drop the mortality uh, some other questions we have sanket do it Yes, sir, I have one question. Yes, uh, sir, yeah. uh, so basically mentioned about uh, uh, MSP. Yes. And you showed yeah. a very beautiful picture where you compared with Kappa's uh, Kauda and uh, this thing, uh, Catford. So is it a special temporal expression or is it uh, specific to a particular stage, sir? How is it, sir? Matlab, I was confused a bit. Uh, oh, no, no. It was actually, actually, this is unpublished data I showed you. A uh, lot of things have to be done on it. Actually, we we uh, purified this MSP protein, generated antibody against this protein. It's not a monoclonal antibody; it's a polyclonal. Okay, and uh, and we tried to stain the the immunofluorescent staining uh, of the spermatozoa from the kappa cells, from the corpus cells, and the corda cells, and we found out that they are showing in this kind of regions. And then we uh, isolated the membranes from uh, this kappa corpus and corda cells and then uh, did the ELISA with that protein, uh, ELISA. And then we found out from the membrane protein that, yeah, it is actually increasing as, as the spermatozoa is maturing. 
so was it done in the caprin model or the human it model it was done in caprin model but the last picture on the right panel one picture was there that was human ejaculated spermatozoa <laughs> actually yeah, was, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and uh, so one more question uh, you mentioned uh, one of your slides that uh, uh, ODA genes, which are respect, with respect to uh, the axonomal structure, 9 plus 2 uh -huh. structure. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, is there any correlation between uh, the abnormal semen parameters as well as the normal sperm samples uh, with, with respect to human sub subjects? Uh, sorry, just once more, please. So yes. Is there any difference between abnormal semen parameters, say oligo, asteno, or terato, uh -huh. with respect to normal sperm samples? Uh, in, in context in, of these genes on the context of these genes that is why actually this review was done that so many problems happen due to non expression of these genes but uh, in 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 uh, i mean there is no no such guideline or guidebook over there so that you can say okay this gene has not expressed so you have uh, infertility and all that but we people have seen in basic research that uh, these uh, genes when they are like suppressed or or things something like that then it causes this kind of of, uh, this kind of uh, problems of mortality going down. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shukla, sir. Sanjay, sir. Dr. Sanjay. Shukla ji, are you there? So, uh, I, uh, Sanjay, can we move? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, well, thank, sir, thank you thank so much, you, thank you so much, sir, thank for that excellent thank lecture. You. Thank and you. Uh, even the slide, what you mentioned there, mm -hmm. uh, with respect to pH, when I published a paper in the pH, uh, whatever the pH you get to observe in the routine practice doesn't fit the criteria of WHO. It was always <laughs> towards alkaline. <laughs> yeah. than but uh, anyways, uh, having said that, thank you so much, sir. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you so much. Sir, sir, sir. Sorry, sir. I was a bit uh, absent. Uh, Sadhip, sir, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was it was a great great lecture uh, covering all the basics of the spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis, especially. Um, so uh, again, uh, a very basic question: uh, Do you have some some dietary uh, suggestions uh, to 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 control those things? Uh... Uh, not, not, not promptly. I can give any answer to that. I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist. But yeah, obviously, I think you are in a, you have a very, very, very valid, valid thing that maybe malnutrition is one of the reasons that pe many people in India, in the rural areas, they are infertile. That can be pollution and inf and malnutrition are the major reasons. Because I remember uh, there are many uh, studies from the University of I mean Calcutta University mm -hmm. uh, regarding the the uh, organophosphates and uh, other um, uh, insecticides and pesticides that are being used in the uh, agriculture. Right, in the food materials, yeah. Yes, yeah. and their effects on the uh, testicles. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, this is another uh, area where we have, I mean, your research can adjunct to their right, research. Right, right, right. There is another, in another completely separate field which can be looked at to take care of the motility of cells. All right. So congratulations for your wonderful talk, Thank you. Sudipta. Thank you, sir. Thank you so Thank much. You. Sanket, please take over. I think Sanket is offline. No, no, he's there. Uh, back. Sorry, sorry, yes, sorry. Perfect. <laughs> some internet connection issue. Uh, well, sir, thank you so much Sudhir Prasad for that wonderful lecture. And uh, without uh, much further delay, I would like to introduce the next speaker. Yes, we have uh, uh, Dr. Merrick, uh, Dr. Merrick, who is uh, currently working as a student professor uh, at the Center of Systems Modeling and uh, uh, Quantitative Biomedicine, SMQB University of Birmingham. And uh, he has done his uh, uh, fellowship in, again from SM, uh, SMQB, and he's uh, been recipient of uh, Ivan Lavis uh, Jones Young Scientist Prize, Andrology Society, uh, British Andrology Society. And uh, he has done his uh, research fellowship in uh, School of Mathematics, 
uh, from the year 2015 to 2019. He has done his PhD in uh, Applied Mathematics uh, from University of Birmingham in the year 2015. And his main research interest main development of tools for sperm selection and the diagnostics and integration of uh, mathematical modeling with experiments model based approaches for uh, image analysis. So he has uh, developed uh, a few models, uh, software packages, which are freely available. That is, that is quite interesting. That is fast uh, flagellar capture and sperm tracking, fully automated software, and also and also nearest open source uh, mystery efficient uh, simulations for. Welcome, Dr. Mari. Over to you. Thank you so much. Let me just uh, share my screen. Um, so I hope you can you can hear me and see my screen, okay? Yes, very much, please. Brilliant. So it's great. I mean, it's great to be here. Uh, another change. We've had a great talk from a clinician and then uh, a biologist, and now we've got a mathematician. So something new again. Uh, I'd just like to start by acknowledging uh, the funding that's paid for me to do a lot of my work uh, from the UK uh, research councils. And really, I'm going to start thinking about sperm and sperm motility, but really the context is not just thinking about how heads move and how fast cells are moving, but actually what the flagellum is doing, what the tail beat is telling us about the sperm and how we can use that to gain more insight when we think about diagnostics and also when we think about treatment. So I'd like to start off by just giving you a bit of an introduction of where we're from at the University of Birmingham. So we're really lucky to have this wide, uh, varied campus. So we're in the middle of the UK, um, right in what we call the Midlands, right? If you put a pin in the middle of the map, that's where we are. And we've, we're really interdisciplinary environment. So we have all the standard things that you expect a university to have, um, but we also have really close links with the hospitals. So the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is one of the largest single site hospitals in Europe uh, and Birmingham Women's Hospital as well, which is where we have our fertility center. Uh, is located just opposite the university. So I'm based, uh, as the introduction kindly said, in the Center for Systems Modeling and Quantitative Biomedicine. So we're a really um, odd group of mathematicians, computer scientists, and experimentalists, all based within a medical school uh, in the university. So we're really integrating these quantitative approaches to try and assess problems and, and help innovate uh, within healthcare. So by working with clinicians, uh, working with uh, embryologists, like I know a lot of the audience are, um, we're really helping to, to tackle some of the problems we're thinking about from a, a holistic uh, way. I also work really closely with the Center for Human Reproductive Science. So the, uh, the CHRS is based within Birmingham Women's Hospital, but it's bridging that gap between the hospitals uh, and the universities. So, everything that we do is really driven by the clinical environment and what the patients say. So we're not just a bunch of mathematicians in a room uh, doing some computation, we're really uh, trying to link what we're doing closely uh, with improving uh, access to healthcare. I'd just like to introduce you to the team. Um, so Dr. Jackson Kirkman Brown, uh, he runs the Center for Human Reproductive Science. Uh, he has an MBE for doing surgical sperm retrieval uh, on uh, British troops who had blast injuries. Professor Dave Smith, who is a professor of applied mathematics, so he's a fluid dynamicist, a real expert in how to do simulations of uh, small scale flows. And then my two PhD students, uh, Cara and Atticus, who have just submitted their PhD theses in the last uh, month or so. In fact, Cara has her PhD Viber on Tuesday, so we're all really looking forward to that. So that's the kind of context of everything that I'm gonna be speaking to today. So obviously we're, we're here to, for a, a great session about sperm. So really we're thinking about what, what is the male factor? What's the male part of infertility? And really infertility, as, as we all know, is, is a global problem. It's really widespread. It's emotionally devastating. And all the treatments that we have currently really focus on the woman, even though half the problem uh, is the male. And we, we know that half of all cases come from the male. So even though, uh, all the talks today have really focused on sperm. That's not really the case, as you'll know uh, from treatment. Often the man kind of gets overlooked. And actually, this, this leads to an unfair burden on the woman as well. So all the invasive treatment, all the uh, 
problems or the burden of infertility really, really falls on the woman the way we, we address it. And actually, it's time we shared this burden, developed better tools for assessing sperm, like uh, some of the ones that you've heard already today. Now, there are many aspects of sperm health, um, but without motility, there's no chance for the sperm to reach the egg. So that's really what I focus uh, my understanding, my research on. I'm really thinking, how can we use ideas of uh, motility and what happens naturally to really think about what's going on when things are going wrong and how we can use that in diagnosis and treatment? So the crucial idea is that novel theragnostics, so treatments and therapies for male factors, actually require better tools to establish sperm quality. We have some tools, we have a lot of um, ways in which we can assess the sperm, but really when we talk about motility, what people are normally talking about is head movement. And sperm head movement provides some information about the cell behavior, but we also know that it's not being linked reliably to clinical outcomes. So when the analogy I like to use uh, is not quite as graphic as uh, Alejandro's dog analogy, but I like to think if you're watching me in a swimming pool and I'm swimming back and forward doing laps, if you can only see my head, you know how fast I'm moving, you know the distance that I'm covering, but you don't know how efficiently I'm swimming, you don't know what stroke I'm doing, you don't know if I'm about to collapse because I'm actually really struggling and gasping for air. And that's really what we're doing when we're ignoring the tail and thinking about only the head. We're losing that richness of data and we're not bringing in all the information that we can be. And really the crucial thing is that sperm motion is governed by the flagellum. The head isn't pulling the tail along, it's the tail that is pushing the, the head. It's the tail that's responding to its environment and really it's the tail we need to be thinking about. So of all the things that's kind of going on in the sperm, actually for the tail to beat and beat in a way that it progresses the sperm well and efficiently, there's a lot of things that have to be going right. You have to have healthy baseline metabolism, you have to have cat spur, you have to have good signaling within the cell. All these things have to come together to get that nice uh, beat that we see. And of course the sperm has to be put together correctly. Its morphology has to be the same. So all of these things we can really think about as being seen as a readout in the flagellar beak. And morphology is a really big thing. We often think about morphology and motility as being separate, um, but we know from our modeling studies we've done in Birmingham that if you do make slight changes to say the shape of the head or the volume of the head, then that can have a really big knock on on the shape of the waveform, far bigger than the, the corresponding change in the head. So, you might not see a small change uh, to head morphology, something like having uh, poorly compacted DNA, but you will see a big change uh, in the tail. So that's something to bear in mind. And actually tails also tell us about the surrounding fluid environment. And as we know, sperm have to go through many different fluid environments. And I'll talk more about this uh, in the next slide. But actually knowing how the tail's moving tells us about the environment and tells us what's going on. So the question is then, how do we assess sperm? How can we gain insight? And what's, what's the best way to actually look at what's going on? Well, the current gold standard as set out by the WHO is just manual analysis. So looking down a microscope, we can make a count. We can make a calculate the proportion of cells that are fast moving and the proportion of the cells that are slow moving. And that gives us some information about what's going on. But as uh, was shown in the first talk, sperm move really, really quickly. It's super hard to assess them by eye. You can see that they're moving, they're moving fast, but you can't really tell is this a good movement pattern. You can't really tell what, what the details of this sperm beat doing. And of course, sperm are really, really heterogeneous as well. So we're actually looking in some cases for that needle in the haystack. You know, we all know the fact that only 4% of sperm have what we consider to be normal forms but that's 4% in a population of millions and millions. So actually picking out those, as, as was highlighted really well earlier, is a difficult task. And actually we wouldn't, we shouldn't expect people to be able to do this by eye. So what's the, uh, the alternative then? Well, the alternative to doing things by eye is to use a computer and use computer vision. So whether that's uh, AI tracking, whether that's CASA, 
Actually, the only way we currently do this uh, routinely is to track head movements. And as I've said, and as studies have shown, head movements don't tend to correlate very well uh, with clinical outcomes. And I'll talk more about how some of these head movement calculations are done and where some of the issues might be arising with that. So that all sounds quite negative, but what's the positive side? Well, what we're trying to do is combine tails with mechanistic modeling. So using the maths of sperm, the maths of swimming and fluid dynamics to actually gain deeper insight into what's going on. So not just how fast is this sperm moving, but actually more insight, like how efficiently is it swimming? How fast is it beating its tail? What's the metabolic requirements of this cell within this population? And actually, when people criticize CASA, what they often say is CASA can't do a realistic count. CASA can't do an accurate concentration compared to, say, counting in a, in a Neubauer uh, hemocytometer. But actually, I think that's the wrong uh, point of view to be taking. We shouldn't be trying to consider CASA as a, as a replication of what we can do by manual analysis. We're very, very good at doing counts manually. Actually, what CASA should be thinking, what we should think of CASA and, and computer an, uh, analysis more widely as, is actually just addition. What additional information can it give us that we can't get by eye? Not how well does it do what we already do? And as I briefly mentioned, there are lots of other tests we can do on sperm. You've heard about quite a lot of them already today. Um, so, you know, things like DNA fragmentation, things like um, protein markers, uh, things like detailed uh, staining for morphology. Um, so I'm not going to focus on any of these uh, today, but we have uh, assessed some of those in a recent paper uh, that we wrote following the release of the WHO. So that was published uh, last month in Fertility and Sterility. So that's Baldi et al. So what we're going to talk about for the remainder of this talk is actually how do we prepare a sample to do a computer analysis? What, what are the things that we really need to think of? When we're doing a computer analysis, say with heads as, as is currently done, what measurements are being made and actually what things do we need to think about in terms of how we're imaging and how we're actually doing the calculations? You know, how can we get good informative measures using heads? And then what do heads miss and actually what do tails bring in? So that's going to be the structure of the talk going forward. So my first key point really is that preparation of the sample really matters when we're talking about motility. So human sperm, as we've said, encounter a really wide range of environments. Those environments have very different fluid properties. So from semen, obviously we have the ejaculate, and then after half an hour that uh, goes through a process of liquefaction. So the viscosity tends to drop. But then we have cervical mucus and cervical mucus changes viscosity and changes structure uh, throughout the, the cycle from less viscous to, to really very viscous and difficult to penetrate. And we also have treatment medias, things that we extract sperm and actually put them into to assess them, maybe um, for IVF, maybe to, to select for ICSI. And all of these have different fluid properties and we'll have different sorts of sperm motility in. So when we're thinking about doing measurements, we really need to be thinking about what have we done to the sperm? What have we put it in? And when we want to do comparisons, are we doing fair comparisons between the same sorts of uh, media profiles? So just as a, a quick highlight of what I mean by this. So on the left here, um, we have the head track in red of the sperm and then the tails as it swims. The sperm in a low viscosity media, so something like diluted semen, or maybe um, a balanced salt solution uh, like EBSS that we might use uh, to prepare sperm in. And then on the right, we have a high viscosity mucus analog. So imagine sperm swimming through cervical mucus. Uh, here we've used a 1% uh, methyl cellulose preparation that, that has kind of uh, fluid properties that are similar to mucus. So it's very, very slightly viscoelastic, but really very viscous. And you see there's a very big difference in the flagellar waveform between these two cells. So actually, we can't do a fair comparison between the two, but we can contrast. And there are many open questions uh, with preparation. So there's questions around whether preparing sperm in a high viscosity analog might actually be the best indicator of natural motility. If that's the environment they have to swim through uh, in traversing the cervix, then maybe that's the test we should be putting it through in order to understand whether it's going to be uh, a good sperm uh, for conception. And actually another question is, can we predict 
from the low viscosity behavior or from the treatment media, can we predict that mucus penetration ability just by looking at shape and uh, other aspects of, of sperm motility within that environment? So once we've prepared ourselves, we then need to think about tracking them and imaging them. Oh, and one more point, actually, so that the control of the sample temperature is actually essential. So we all know we should be imaging sperm at 37 degrees, keeping it in an incubator to make sure that the motility is, is being preserved at its natural uh, rate. So once we've done a good preparation, we can then think about how we actually track the cells. So here's a, a little video of a CASA system, so very similar to the one that um, previous presenter shown. So this is Hamilton Thorne's uh, new software. And you see we have sperm swimming in the image and the heads are tracked and we get a nice little head track pulled out. Here's what I found. But if we contrast that to uh, what a sperm is doing, actually, if we look in detail, if by boiling it down to just tracking a single point and creating this, what is a yellow line on this picture on the right hand side, we're losing all this detailed information about what, is, what the tail is doing. We don't know, we know how fast it's moving, we don't know how, fish, how efficiently we, it's moving. We don't know if this is a sperm that's really struggling to swim. Uh, we don't know if it's a sperm that's got beating on just one side of its flagellum. We don't really know what's going on at all. By throwing away that tail movement, we're already limiting ourselves to what we can find. So once we've got this head movement, the question is how do we analyze it and what information do we get from it? So you'll typically see a path like this. So each dot uh, on, this, on this line is a single frame from your camera where you've just taken that center point of your head. And then you can draw them all together and you create a, a curvy linear path of the head and then we can make some measurements. So the typical measurements that people, people think about are VCL, so the velocity of the curvy linear path or how fast is the sperm moving along this path. We can think about drawing the average path. So rather than thinking about the side to side motion, you can think what's the kind of long term progression of the sperm in the kind of direction it's moving. And we'll go through to talk about ways in which you can calculate this average path in a bit. But once you've calculated it, you can think about how fast a sperm is moving over this average path. You can do simpler measures like the straight line. So you can join the first uh, and the last path together and, and calculate the straight line velocity. So how fast do we move from point A to point B? And you can also calculate things that aren't about velocity at all. So you can think about um, ALH, the amplitude of lateral head velocity, or how side to side is the sperm going? How uh, curved is this path? So the angular displacement. And then there's lots of other measurements, uh, such as the ones that Alejandro talked about in the first slide, that are combinations of each of these, such as linearity, wobble, et cetera, that are just fraction uh, ratios of, of pairs of these measurements. The measurement uh, that is used in CASA to relate to the tail is called uh, BCF or beat cross frequency. So that's how often the actual curvy linear path that the head takes crosses the average path. And we'll come back to this uh, in a bit, but actually this is a measurement that we've shown that doesn't actually correlate to the thing that, that um, one says it does, which is actually how fast the flagellum is beating. So when we take all these measures, we now need to think about how we're actually gonna, gonna get the data and then how we're gonna analyze it. So really the key thing to think about is we've said that preparation matters, well, the other thing is that imaging matters, actually how we image and how we take uh, our data matters. And particularly uh, for heads, they're really sensitive to acquisition error. So you can do things without realizing it and actually really change the results that you get out. And I'll show you a few more examples in the coming slides. But the key um, points we're gonna think about is actually the imaging frame rate. So how fast your camera that's attached to your CASA setup is. And actually, um, the duration of acquisition. So this is a much less uh, obvious step, but actually how long you image for really affects your results as well. You often think that uh, the longer you image for, the better, the more data you're going to have, but that's not necessarily the case. So let's take the first of these, so frame rate. And we're gonna think about that uh, curvy linear path 
to the path that the head joins out. So taking all those individual points that we've tracked with our camera and joining them together to create the line that the head takes. And we're going to imagine we're imaging at four different um, frame rates. So we've got a camera that can fire at 169 hertz, 100 hertz, 60 hertz, and then 30 hertz. So this is the 169 hertz camera. You see the red dots here are the track of the sperm. And the gray line here is the actual true path that it's taken. So we can imagine that um, what we're trying to do with the red path is get it as close as possible uh, to the gray path. And you see at 169 hertz, that's doing a really, really good job. If we bring down to 100 hertz, which what is what a lot of systems, uh, your newer systems tend to use, you see we're still doing a very good job. We haven't got all the exact detail at 169 hertz, but we haven't really lost anything. We've still pretty much uh, recovered the uh, behavior pretty much exactly. Down to 60 hertz then, and 60 hertz uh, is what most of the um, slightly older CASA systems use. And we're still doing a very good job. We've still mostly caught the detail, not all the detail on the corners, but, but we're doing a fairly good job. And then if you go down to 30 hertz that some of the cheaper cameras use, now you see we've got a really big issue and we're actually really changing the behavior of the path. And that's gonna really change any measurements that we have based on curvy linear velocity. Because remember that time is still being held the same. It's just um, the distances that we're really measuring. And if our distances are decreasing because of what our path looks like, then actually our velocities are gonna get much higher even though they might not be uh, in reality. So frame rate really, really matters. Luckily, most CASA systems use a fixed frame rate, and that frame rate has been set for that CASA system, so that's not a problem. But it really comes to be an issue when you start thinking about comparing between systems if you don't know uh, what the frame rates are that they've worked at. The slightly more um, confusing thing that, that might make a difference is the duration of imaging. So how long you actually image your sample for, and it's not a case of necessarily more is better, because sometimes actually you just need to be really careful about what you're doing. So for example, if I want to calculate the straight line velocity of a cell, and I want to think about something that's swimming in a fairly, a fairly constant pace like this sperm on the left-hand side. So we often see circular sperm uh, when we look at a low viscosity media. You might naively say, well, that's not a progressive sperm because it's just going around in a circle, but actually what we know from, from motility is that sperm that circle uh, in low viscosity can often be very, very progressive in high viscosity. So that's not necessarily a problem. And you look by looking at the sections that I've divided up uh, here, that each of these sections are approximately the same length. You, you can see that this sperm is pretty much swimming at a constant speed going round and round. So what we're going to do is imagine that we are imaging this sperm, so starting from zero, and we're going to calculate the straight line velocity uh, imagining that we stopped after half a second, after one second, and so on, and just seeing what happens to the straight line velocity as time goes on. So we see we start with a sperm after, after half a second that's swimming with a straight line velocity of 40 microns a second. So we'd say this is a very progressive sperm. It's swimming rapidly. It's doing a great job. But as we image for longer, it looks like the sperm is actually getting slower until we get to having imaged this sperm for two and a half seconds. And now it's below the five micron a second for a, for a fast swimming progressive sperm. But we can see by looking at the track that, that it is a progressive sperm. It is swimming very well. And what's happened is that actually our measurement isn't good for this type of motility. So we really need to have that in mind when we're thinking about the CASA measures and thinking about comparing the measures. Are they measuring the right thing? And does the measurement make sense in the context of what the sperm is doing? But also, can we compare between different systems? If I have a system that's measuring VSL, uh, straight line velocity, uh, after two seconds every time, and you have a system that's measuring it after one second, are we gonna be making the right comparisons? But it's not just um, how we capture the data and how long we capture the data for, it's how we analyze the data that's really, really important. And actually, if we think about calculating the average path, that's possibly the best way to think about where the data analysis really comes into it. So what I'm gonna do now is show you uh, two different sperm that we've tracked. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of ways that we can calculate the average path. So in this case, we're not trying to match 
the gray path that the head is going to track out. We want that straight line through the middle of the path that's kind of looking at the long term progression of the cell. And again, we're going to look at these four different um, frame rates that we talked about before. So these first two algorithms, an 11 point moving average and a 30 point moving average, I won't go into the details of what they mean, but these are the algorithms that are commonly used uh, in CASA systems. And you can see for our, our two sperm. Uh, the 30 point average is kind of doing an okay job, but actually there's a huge variation in what this average path is for different frame rates. So it's really, really susceptible to how fast you're imaging and what's going on. And you can see at the end, we're not doing a very good job. Often systems cut off the end, so that's less of an issue. But this is a really unstable thing, and, and we really want to be confident that what we're doing is, is going to be accurate and is going to work for lots of frames and lots of different cell types. So what we've done is use some um, mathematics of signal processing called the wavelet decomposition, and actually shown that if you use mathematical ideas of how signals are transferred and how we average signals, you can get much better than the commonly used methods and much more robust methods. So you see that there's very little change now between the different colored lines. You're gonna get very similar results no matter what system you're working on. So that's some, some caveats about how we track heads. Obviously, a thing about tracking heads is that it's very easy to do. We can track bright dots on a dark background. And actually, historically, that's been very, very useful in getting us to this stage. I don't want to suggest that CASA is a bad thing or has or is, uh, never provided us any use. It's been a wonderful thing and a great tool. But actually, now we have better tools and we can, we can use uh, our new insight to get more information. So what about the tail then? So historically, a significant barrier to flagellar tracking has been the time and the input it requires. And whereas, like with tracking heads or doing manual analysis, we really need to be able to track hundreds or thousands of cells with really minimal input. So we've created fast flagellar analysis and sperm tracking to do this. So basically, CASA for tails with no extensive user input and really simple to use. And when I say simple to use, I mean just like CASA, you put in your details, you put in your sample identifier, and you hit go, and you get something out like this. It will track all your cells in your video in negative phase microscopy. You can use your CASA system and get uh, tail information out. And tails really give you more information. They highlight variations in the environment and also the biochemistry of the cell. So we have in a low viscosity, say a treatment media, the classic side to side wide flagellar beat. If we put cells in a high viscosity fluid like cervical mucus, we get a notably different beat where it's much, there's much less bending near the head and much more bending with a tight curvature region towards the end of the tail that's much more progressive through that high viscosity environment. And if we think about cells that are adhered and then uh, stimulated, so for example, the cell on the right that's been stimulated with 4-aminopyridone to simulate um, hyperactivation, we can immediately see by looking at the tail, this drastic change in behavior that comes from hyperactivation. Hyperactivation really is a tail effect, not a head effect. And that's why we can see it in the flagellar capture much more clearly than we can in heads. So in 2019, when we reached fast, we wanted to track more tails than ever before. So we tracked 200 cells in a low viscosity diluted semen and 120 cells in high viscosity. And really that's shown in our, in our human reproduction paper where we looked at all these parameters and you can really see the change between high viscosity and low viscosity here. I mentioned at the start um, BCF, the beat cross frequency. You hear here, if we compare between the flagellar beat frequency calculated using FAST and BCF, there's no correlation between the two. They, they really don't match up. But tails give us more than just some insight into to, um, what's going on with beating, actually we can use flagellar waveforms and image analysis together with fluid dynamics to give a readout of power and things like what the velocity profile is as sperm swim to see what's going on. And actually if we know how things are moving and we know what the fluid is, we then can estimate metabolic quantities and actually think about how much energy the cell is using, which experimentally is really hard to do, especially if you then want to use those sperm in treatment. And as I said at the start, tails even give insight into morphology. So as takeaways for FAST, um, 
heads only tell you about the speed of swimming and they're really sensitive to how we measure them and how we calculate them. Head tracks, as we know, are generally not clinically informative, but the tail is really much richer in information. And really we think about the tail as a fitness test for the sperm. Everything has to be good in order for it to move in the way that progresses the sperm well. But the big question uh, that we have yet to answer is, does this have any clinical relevance? Actually, should we be thinking about sperm at all, or really do we need to just be focusing on more treatments uh, for the woman? And particularly, does selecting sperm make a difference? Well, I'm going to highlight uh, a trial now that we've just finished running in Birmingham, which is the HAB Select trial. So the HAB Select trial was looking at sperm picking using hyaluronic acid binding. So it's a multi-center randomized controlled trial uh, published in the Lancet in 2019. And actually we showed that using PICSI or ICSI, so either standard ICSI sperm selection or picking using binding, didn't make a, a statistical difference to the uh, primary outcome, which was live birth. But it did make a massive difference, a 38 re uh, reduction in miscarriage rates. So we know that actually selecting sperm can make a huge difference. And this gives us confidence that if we use the tail, we can also start to find some of these differences as well. And actually, if we think about that in terms of how does this change with the age of the female partner, you can see that miscarriage rates as a woman gets older, obviously get much, much higher. But if we use this sperm selection process, we can really flatten that curve and reduce the miscarriage rates, particularly for older women. This has just been accepted for publication uh, in human reproduction. So the good question to ask now is, well, if it's getting really bad with uh, female age, but selection sperm makes a difference, what about male age? So I'd just like to highlight this study um, from Horta et al, from the Temple Smith Lab uh, out of Australia, published in 2019. So they looked at two and a half thousand IVF ICSI cycles of couples with idiopathic infertility and plotted them by female age and male age. And as you expect, the probability for live birth decreases, decreased remarkably with female age, as we know. But there's also a really significant drop with male age as well. So sperm selection is really important. And actually, it's not just women whose fertility decreases with age. It's men as well. And we, we generally think that this is to do with uh, extra DNA damage in older men. And then by selecting out from that, by selecting the sperm, we can actually get past that miscarriage rate, which we think is really due to um, sperm DNA damage. So just to wrap up then, fast forward for, to today. So we're currently using FAST to analyze samples from couples undergoing treatment at Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. And we've analyzed over 20,000 sperm from 100 couples so far. We're also being used worldwide to analyze human sperm, but also animal sperm of various species in many countries. And we were highlighted in the WHO sixth edition as, a, as emerging technology and the concept of um, the tails is, is talked about more there. If you have a product a project that we're interested uh, for flagellar analysis, please get in touch. We'd love to talk more uh, with you. So finally, then just to wrap up, we really think that current ways of assessing sperm need to be improved so we get that clinical relevance that we really sorely need. And that the tail is much richer information than just looking at the head. How the tail moves, really, we think of as a fitness test for the whole sperm. Everything has to be good in order to swim. All the signaling, all the um, construction, everything. The man's age and his sperm are really both important, and how we select sperm in treatment matters. And finally, we really think flagellar capture will provide the required insight to make a difference, and that's what we're trying to do uh, in the coming years. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and look forward to taking any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mirik. I think uh, it is very uh, good lecture, excellent lecture we have uh, listened. Actually, you told us about the how the movement is uh, affecting the uh, motility and everything, uh, the sperm. So, uh, uh, we have any questions uh, regarding that, uh, Sankit? Uh, so, currently, uh, we have something there's one question from Saraswati Gupta. So according to the latest study by uh, uh, Gadalas and team along with tail beating, sperm head spins about their long axis. So along with the flagellar beat, will the sperm uh, spinning will also have some significance in determining the sperm quality? Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to point out a couple of things about that study. One, 
um, the original paper was retracted um, because of some issues with the way the data was analyzed. Um, heads don't spin, tails move. So the way the fluid dynamics works uh, at low Reynolds number is there's no inertia. It's not like being in a swimming pool. So if you're kicking in a swimming pool and you stop kicking, you'll glide along. Sperm don't live in that world. Sperm live in a world where if they stop moving, they instantly stop moving. The head doesn't have any ability to turn. You know, it can't, it can't do this the way that we do it. They can just move their tail. So actually there are 3D patterns of sperm movement. And this is important for fish sperm, um, other types of sperm that, that live in these big fluid environments. Human sperm actually swim through a really small compacted environment. So they tend to, it's, it's not really like swimming through a, a swimming pool like we would. It's like swimming through a small narrow chamber where they kind of find little grooves uh, to, to swim through. And when they do that, and particularly in um, viscous solutions like cervical mucus, they swim with a very flat beat and a very planar beat. They don't tend to, to wobble so much or, or spin. So actually, while I think 3D imaging is interesting for lots of animal sperm, I don't think it's quite relevant for human sperm. Yeah, please, Dr. Yes, Katisa, please. Yeah. Sir, I would like to ask you one thing, the dynamics of the sperm kinetics. When we see in a casa, we load them on a slide, but isn't the peripheral environment when we load them on a slide in casa different to the intrauterine environment where the sperm have to negotiate anti-gravity through the gush of the mucus surrounding incorporating ex, uh, increasing viscosity so don't the dynamics change at that time the torque the torsion everything happen on it okay so that's yeah. where the morphology also comes so that's the dynamism completely changes because ultimately it's the energy expelled by the sperm in motility on a slide will definitely be more than the energy expelled intrauterine yeah, there's some interesting points there definitely thank you so sperm uh, I think the, the key point here is to think less about gravity and more about direction of flow. So sperm, if you, if you do kind of the swim up test on its side, you'll still get exactly the same dynamics because it's about, about flow direction rather than gravity. Um, so the CASA slide provides some, certainly some information. I think there's, there's a couple of things here. The, the confinement is very, very good because it gives us something that's more like what happens in the female environment. So actually, Confining cells, I think, is a good thing for how they swim. Um, there's an issue about viscosity. Can we predict what, what behaviors are in physiological fluids from non-physiological fluids? That's, that's definitely an interesting open question. Um, but I think we can kind of get around that by knowing what the fluid environments we are, are looking in. So if we know we're looking in a low viscosity fluid, then we don't want to compare directly, but we can use the information to inform what's going on uh, elsewhere. Uh, and I think the final question about CASA slides is something that we're really interested in, is actually how well does sperm disperse through that slide? So we know uh, naturally what happens, sperm's kind of, well, human sperm's primary navigation mechanism, um, other than rheotaxis, is boundary following, boundary navigation. So actually by allowing sperm to, to follow boundaries, that really is a test of, of, are they doing the things we see physiologically? So morphology does play a part and it plays a part in that, but also the way the morphology is shaped, we can see in the tail because the morphology, because of the drag profile in the cell has a big, big impact on what the tail shape is. Carry on, proceed to the next question. Who's there, what is there? Professor uh, Vetsa. Sanjayji, do you have any question? I do not have a question, but it was an interesting um, study. Uh, and perfect beating retreat um, for this uh, wonderful session today on this firm. Um, I'm sure uh, had you been uh, able to do this work earlier, Michael Phelps would be <laughs> quite happy to learn the dynamics Anyways, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gallagher. It was a wonderful talk. Sir, with your permission, I have one question. Yes. Uh, Dr. Merrick. Uh, Dr. Merrick, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, see, basically, how we look at the spermatozoa is different uh, when compared to your mathematical models. We basically look at it the apart from the concentration, the total count, uh, everything remains the percentage. Uh, 
if you look at the total mortality, morphology, or vitality, or anything else. So uh, my question is with respect to your earlier slides, where you mentioned about uh, uh, the sp sperm trafficking. So what information does it provide? See, basically, uh, if you look at it, uh, the spermatozoa does attain the motility and a very low viscous model. Once the sample is liquefied only, it will attain the motility. So before that, there'll be no motility. So what information does, does it really provide? And what are the applications? Like, how can we improve with this? Uh, uh, with this aspect? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think, I mean, a key aspect for me is, can we predict which sperm would be successful naturally? So by the way we look at them, can we say, this one has all the characteristics that we're going to need to be able to get there naturally. So this is the one we want to be using in treatment because that's the good one that's selected out. So I think that's that's kind of the best way to think about how we can predict using different viscosity fluids without actually using them. And I think bringing the modeling in is a really important part of that because we can do tests and simulations with modeling that you can't do with experiment. And we can gain that kind of statistical view over what the, what the chances are of what's going on by putting like real track sperm through simulated tests to see what they do. Uh, yeah, because you no, know, what we're trying to do in uh, uh, AIT procedures is like mm -hmm. we are getting uh, the the sample, if it is viscous, highly viscous, we're trying exactly. to get it to the low viscous model, right? Okay. Because it will enable the spermatozoa to move. So that is our main intention over there. Okay. So because we can uh, clearly do the analysis and the preparation part be, depending on that. Yeah. So, but in case of uh, uh, your mathematical models, what you propose over there and uh, what exactly i just want to know the information what does it provide like uh, you mentioned that of course uh, the motor whatever remains in the tail will be the propeller uh, but head also has a certain role to play uh, with respect to motility yeah yeah so i mean the the information it provides so we i think the key added benefit that has has direct relevance is the energy consumption of the cell so we know how efficient it's swimming how what the me metabolic requirements are so how it's transporting energy along that tail mm -hmm. and whether it's going to have enough it's going to be swimming in a way that isn't just going to burn itself out very quickly you know whether whether everything's going on but i think more importantly than that is our aim is to use the shape the movement everything else about the tail to actually tell us are all the signaling processes going well because they have to be for to get the right sort of shape is the head compacted properly? So is the, day, is the DNA essentially good quality because changes to the head will affect the tail? So our aim is to be able to eventually say, this is a good tail shape. This will have all those other things right with it because of its tail shape. We don't have that yet. What we need to be doing is getting into more clinics, doing trials, running, which is what we're doing with Birmingham Women's Hospital. And we have a bunch of other clinics worldwide that are interested in partnering. So really what we need is the, the data that we can then analyze and then we can pull out those sorts of relationships as well. The first task was to, in the same way that um, Alejandro was talking, the first task is to create the software to do it and the tool, which is what we've done. The next task is how do you use the tool and how does the tool help you? And that's what we're next. Yeah. 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 Sir? Hello, thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Uh, Sanket, please take over. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Merrick, for that. You know, uh, the different perspective of how the mathematician looks at the spermatozoa. And uh, to proceed with, I'll be introducing the moderators for the panel. So we have uh, Dr. Vijay Mangali, sir. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to introduce uh, uh, sir. He's currently working as a laboratory director at Fertility Clinic and IVF Center in Mumbai. And he's associated with human IVF since uh, uh, like more than three decades for now. And uh, he's uh, served as Secretary General for uh, ISER from year 20, 2009 to 2011 and chairperson for embryology of uh, ISER from 2014 to 16. And he's published 21 papers in peer reviewed journals and many presentations through national and international conferences. He has contributed 14 chapters in medical reference books, 
and also recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award in the year 2017 by ISAR. Uh, welcome, uh, Vijay, sir. And uh, the next moderator would be uh, Dr. Charlotte Chatterjee, ma'am. So a dear senior and friend of mine, uh, she's currently working as a scientific head and consultant embryologist at uh, 14 and Fertility Center, Second Abad. She has a 20 years of experience Sankip, in the- Sankip, sorry. Sankip, uh, your slide is not moving. Is it not moving, sir? No. Change the slide. Uh, wait. Yeah. All the slides are gone. Just change the slide. What about now, sir? No. no. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's it. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. So she has experience of 20 years of experience in the medical diagnosis and ERT field. And uh, she has a lot of ac accomplishments uh, to her. And uh, she has learned from the veterans in the ERT field, like uh, Dr. Ingol, uh, Ign Ingolf, and uh, Dr. Patrick Twin, and Dr. Katera, and Dr. Uh, Mercedes, and Dr. James Cat. She has been uh, She has published many journals in uh, various uh, uh, publications in various journals like a journal of obstetrics and gynecology and fertility sterility. And uh, coming to the panel, as I said earlier, like, you know, uh, the, the moderators in the panel uh, needs no introduction at all. Like they are very quite well-known uh, faculty in, uh, uh, in an Indian ERT. And uh, Dr. Kasi sir, uh, Dr. Kasi Avari is a embryologist at- uh, uh, The slides are still not moving, Sanket sir. I'm sorry for that. Uh, yeah, right. Is it visible now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah, I'm sorry for you that. You want me to share the screen? Yeah, please, please, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, sir is MSc PhD in reproductive endocrinology and awarded the uh, Lady Tata Junior Fellowship during his tenure of his PhD program and uh, he has done his postdoctoral fellowship in uh, andrology. And uh, Sarah has been uh, uh, has a vast experience in teaching. He has been uh, teaching for all postgraduate students and from graduate level to postgraduate level in developmental biology and life sciences. And uh, his uh, area of interest to mine is to technology and support and troubleshooting cryobiology and electron microscopy and uh, cytology. Uh, welcome, sir. And next we have uh, Dr. Atna, madam. Again, uh, uh, pleasure to introduce her. She's MBBS and PhD. Uh, she is currently working as Chief Immunologist at, Inst at Institute of Reproductive Medicine, Kolkata. And she has worked as Research Fellow in Tiverland uh, Clinic Foundation, USA. And she has a uh, uh, teaching experiences, uh, uh, like you know, starting from 2002 for the FNB students. And she's working as a faculty in the training program conducted by IRM since 1990. And she is working as a faculty in the training program conducted by IRRH since 2003, she has contributed around six books, uh, textbook chapters. And uh, to her credit, she has around 20 publications in international peer reviewed journals. And uh, her current uh, research interest remains pediatric male infertility and stem cell biology. Welcome, ma'am. And next, we have uh, uh, Dr. Charajat, sir. Uh, sir is a MSc PhD uh, card from Belgium. And uh, sir has done his post graduation in life sciences in the year 1993 and special training in ICSI and IVF from SPERM, uh, Belgium, and special training for embryo freezing from KK Women's Hospital, Singapore, and done special training in laser hatching and PGD from Germany, and he has done his doctorate in life sciences uh, in the year 2018, and he has been so, served as executive committee member for MP Madhya Pradesh chapter, and also executive EC member for Madhya Pradesh IFS chapter, and uh, past vice president for, and also past president for Academy of uh, Clinical Embryologist and currently is working as Medical Director at Jeans ART India Bank. Welcome, sir. And next, we have uh, Gita Goswami, ma'am. She is currently working as Scientific Director at Rich uh, IVF Private Limited. She is R&D Head for uh, at Lab India Life Sciences Private Limited. She is a Senior Scientist at Genetics Department, Delhi University. Specialization includes Genetics, Molecular Biology, and Embryology. She is a Gold Medalist in Genetics from Delhi University. She is a member of ACE and ASHRAE. Uh, she has obtained a training in embryo biopsy in university, from University College of London and uh, at uh, Memorial Hospital, Turkey. And uh, she has trained in PGS using FISH and uh, RACGH and also NGS. And she has published in papers in national and international journals. Welcome, ma'am. Next, we have uh, uh, Dr. Shubangi, ma'am. Uh, she is a senior embryologist at uh, CRGU Center for Reproductive Gynecology of Wales, UK. Her, uh, she has done her post graduation in Diploma in Psychological Counseling. Uh, New Delhi, and she has done her PhD 
from the University of Mumbai, uh, and she has done her Master of Science from the University of Mumbai. She has, uh, to her credit, she has a lot of uh, uh, certifications in various training courses in ERT, uh, from CRUST, IBM, and uh, uh, various other things. And she has experience of her own, uh, like spanning for uh, around two decades. And uh, she is a consultant, a consulting embryologist in several IVF centers in India. And uh, on top of all, out of embryology, something out of embryology, she's uh, interested in. Uh, she's interested in yoga. And uh, next we have. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Next we have Dr. Paragnandi sir. So he's a dear friend of mine, and uh, currently is working as a scientific director and clinical embryologist at Cradle Fertility Center, uh, Kolkata, West Bengal. He has the experience of more than uh, a decade, and he has contributed many book chapters published many papers in national and international journals, and is a convener for research embryology at IFS, member of ACE, IS, uh, ISR and IFS. And um, I would like to say he's a person who is uh, uh, behind the logo of the ACE of India. Welcome, Dr. Parak. And uh, next we have- uh, Thank you. Yeah, another doctor, uh, dear friend of mine, Dr. Akash Agarwal, who is MBBS uh, uh, and extra certified clinical embryologist topper scientific director at Hector Fertility Hyderabad, uh, is an alumnus of Usmani Medical College and uh, topper of history clinical embryology Vienna 2019, and is a uh, keen interest in male infertility, uh, remains in male infertility and with uh, basically surgically retrieved spermatozoa. Welcome Dr. Akash. So over to moderators. Thank you. Can I share the screen now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much all the IHRA team from the bottom of my heart to, you know, give me this opportunity to interact with such a galaxy of experts. It, it's it's really very pleasure thing to, you know, the, the topic given is appears to be very simple. That is understanding the nature of the sperm and sperm selection. Now in this era of uh, ICSI, it may appear as if, you know, we, we, this is not a big uh, deal as such. We can just look under the microscope, select a uh, morphologically normal sperm and then go ahead to the ICSI. Every time you are likely to get more than 80% uh, probability of uh, ICSI. But, but we know that, you know, this is not as simple as that. Uh, and considering the experience of all these great panelists that I have, along with my uh, you know, co-moderator, Dr. Uh, Charlotte Chatterjee, we, we, I think we are really blessed to have uh, such a panel. And let's let's go with uh, straight with the uh, questions. I have divided few, uh, you know, categories because just now we heard three topics with three focus topics from three experts on the uh, sperm selection and different semen parameters. Uh, so I have got slightly offbeat uh, topics for all these experts because I know that they are capable of throwing much light on our small things, uh, the practical um, uh, things that, that, that are required to optimize the fertilization. So let's, let's uh, go to that part. Uh, the first question that uh, comes to my mind is that, let us start with the basic things. Dr. Ratna, I would like to ask you, what are the situations where an embryologist has to deal with male factor associated uh, infertility? Uh, yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, there are so many situations when the embryologists have to deal with male factor associated infertility. Uh, just starting from the uh, collection, uh, you know that during ART procedure, after successful oocyte retrieval, uh, we have to face the problem of failed semen collection. Uh, it may be psychological or there may be some clinical uh, problem by which we can uh, have uh, we don't have the male gametes required for in vitro fertilization. That is one. And uh, uh, we have to just, we try to deal with reducing the anxiety of the male partner by changing the location, by changing the location, by uh, just we offer them to collect uh, in a familiar environment or home collection with the help of the female partner. And Sometimes when we fail, uh, we just give some medicine, the Viagra derivative or sildenafil. And sometimes uh, we have to have the mechanical vibrator. And if it fails, then 
there are only two options that emergency surgical retrieval of male gametes or vitrification of the female gametes oocyte. And you know that another condition, though it is very rare, sometimes there is no ejaculation, but we know it from beforehand, uh, even after orgasm, that is, that may be the retrograde ejaculation. Uh, that time we have to retrieve the sperm uh, from the post-coital or post-masturbated urine and to have the male gametes for in vitro fertilization. And uh, uh, yeah, you know that sometimes uh, we have to face the severe oligoastheno-teratogospermia, severe OAT. Uh, you know that it is really challenging to get a uh, healthy or uh, sperm having um, intact DNA integrity. It is very difficult sometimes, especially in case of severe male factor infertility. Uh, but usually we are during ICSI, uh, normally we try to get a morphologically normal sperm living, that means motile sperm. But when there is some facilities for uh, advanced sperm selection, such as the pixie dish, or the microfluidic arrangement, we try to get the sperm with intact DNA integrity. And um, uh, in, in case of severe OAT, sometimes we are not getting the sperm, even after thorough screening in case of cryptogospermia. In that case, we have to retrieve the sperm by surgical, uh, by surgery, and then do the ICSI. But for, um, this severe male factor infertility or severe OAT, uh, we should evaluate from beforehand the genetic evaluation, whether there is any you know, Y chromosome micro deletion or karyotype error, et cetera. And in case of aduspermia, uh, uh, you know that uh, we just try to uh, have idea whether it is obstructive, then we go for directly for PESA uh, from the epididymis or by TESA, uh, we try to retrieve the sperm and do the ICSI. But in case of non-obstructive aduspermia, uh, if the center have the facility for microtese, that is the best option. But if not, then we do the TESA and try to uh, retrieve the spermatozoa. But you know that when, uh, in case of Normal spermatogenesis, we in 100%, near about 100% cases, we uh, retrieve the sperm. But uh, in case of partial arrest of spermatogenesis, uh, maybe in 80% or 95%, theoretically, we should get the sperm. And when there is uh, total maturation arrest, there may be about 48% chance of retrieval, or some, uh, sometimes you are not getting in uh, properly. And in case of uh, uh, cell only syndrome, there may be only 29 or 20%, even 10% sometimes we can get the, retrieve the sperm. And in case of uh, testicular atrophy, we are not getting the sperm at all uh, for the ICSI. And then with, the, with proper consent uh, and counseling, we have to use the donor sperm for insemination. These are the usual uh, uh, problem we have to face in our day-to-day -day practice regarding male factor infertility. And I already have told you that in case of aspermia, uh, we have to check whether the post-coital or post-masturbation urine contain any sperm or not. If it is there, then on the, on the day of retrieval, uh, we just collect the urine uh, after giving the patient with proper antibiotic and uh, we just, we have to wash the uh, sample. We have to uh, keep the sample for about five minutes, then de uh, decant up the supernatant and the lower hazy portion mixed with large volume of media and uh, twice centrifugation followed by swim up. Most of the cases, the uh, number of sperm motility is not good. So we have to go for ICSI, but I have seen two cases where the number of sperms were good, motility was about 30%, and I did conventional uh, IVF 
and even very rarely we can go for the IUI. These are the common situation we have to face actually. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Dhatna, for compiling, you know, the whole situation of the male factor in a very comprehensive manner. So those newcomers who, are, who have joined and who are listening to this, you know, whole session, they must have realized that uh, we embryologists sometimes really get nightmare while handling the sperms. It is not that easy every time that you just pick up the sperm or do the normal inseminations. Uh, Dr. Charlotta, would you like yeah. to? Yeah. Uh... So this is really a very good start to uh, ha ha have the knowledge about the male infertility. Uh, I will go with the second question. And I uh, my second question goes to Dr. Parag. So Parag, like uh, if the sample is a teratosospermic and oat, so do you feel that looks matter in uh, embryogenesis in the embryo development? Yes, so Dr. Chavadatta, for, uh, thank you for asking this question. Everybody, good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Parag Nandi. I just, uh, this is a very critical question. Every day we face this kind of problem because nowadays male infertility is at hike and we see uh, almost every day that like uh, teratogospermia or severe teratogospermia, morphologically abnormal sperms we uh, get uh, after ejaculation or after seminaresis, we already have uh, idea like that we are going to get the teratogospermic sample on the day of uh, pickup and in during ICSI, we sometimes need to, uh, you know, go for the ICSI uh, for this kind of teratogospermic sample. And uh, from my experience and from the, from the you know, available, uh, all the data uh, which you can see uh, in the screen, like uh, many papers are uh, saying the same, like the, you know, individually, uh, maybe that uh, the sperm, when you are catching at the, during the ICSI, at that time, you may, uh, you know, you are, you are actually selecting. I have MZ, I do select, but, you know, I'm seeing it more uh, bigger way, but I am basically selecting the better one, better sperm on that particular cohort. So in that particular cohort, when I'm seeing that the better, uh, you know, sperm and I'm uh, injecting that sperm. So we all uh, have seen like the many a time, you know, it uh, merely uh, uh, see that, the, you know, it actually gave us the, you know, bad embryo or the implantation rate has declined because all the papers are also staying the same, like the among, uh, you know, you can see these are the papers and abnormal spar morphology, uh, you know, a very, uh, you know, uh, morphology impacted neither the pregnancy rate nor the live birth rate in couple undergoing intrauterine insemination or ICSI or IVF. So here actually uh, that then what is the correlation between morphology and genetics? Like the sperm morphology, which you you can see in this paper, in the present study, they have concluded that although we have we achieved high fertilization and cleavage rates in that particular teratogospermic sample during each the implantation and the ongoing pregnancy rates were very low with high incidence of early pregnancy loss. So although in the present study, we did not have any control, you have to see in this particular paper in 1997, I have found this particular paper. You, you can see that in 1992, we achieved the first uh, pregnancy from ICSI. And at that time, this particular paper came up in five years, within five years, this particular paper came up. But in this particular paper, they are saying, like it says no correlation between sperm morphology and fertilization rate on cleavage rate, but found lower implantation and live birth rate. But in other papers, if you go in the next slide, uh, you know, they are also saying that the head abnormality, especially, especially amorphous head are related to elevated degree of DNA fragmentation. So DNA fragmentation we know and elongated heads when uh, detected as a predominant abnormal form in sperm samples may affect fertilization in ICSI. But this, these are saying like that they have correlation with the morphology and the bad uh, you know, chromosome shape. But they are, if you go to the next slide, you can see that this is a very recent paper in 2020. They have nicely concluded with uh, what they have shown 
like uh, you can see that in 2020, Mitchell published a very interesting review. This, uh, what happens in molecular stage? If sperm DNA fragmentation happens in immature sperm cell, the DNA is repaired by intensive and efficient, uh, you know, repertory mechanisms are there in spermatogonia or spermatocytes. But in a haploid mature sperm cell, these errors cannot be actually repaired anymore. And fragmented DNA is transferred to the oocyte. If the respiratory, if the uh, repertory system of the oocyte fail as well, then no hope. The embryo will be, you know, uh, chromosomal abnormality will be there. But in the in the maternal side, these damage control systems are there. So these are uh, three different types. You basically can see like DDR, SSR, and DSB. It's like direct reversal or single strand damage repair or the double strand break uh, repair. That this double strand break repairs is a very critical process. So hence they concluded what? They concluded like the fragmented DNA is uh, limiting factor negatively affecting embryonal developmental development. The human oocyte is relatively competent to repair DNA damage after fertilization. However, repair activity in oocytes or zygote is affected many unclear factors that to be evaluated. So that means like there are the, the the connection between the morphology and the genetical impairment is there, but correction mechanism again is there. So while we are going to do the ICSI, if we see a complete tattoo sperm example, better to go for a better, uh, uh, you know, better uh, sperm in that particular cohort, go ahead, do ICSI. And then you may see like that, it, you know, uh, live birth rate or the pregnancy rate won't hamper in that case because embryos, uh, they have this mechanism to repair. I have shown this particular, in this particular paper in 2020, this, this is a very good review has published. So as you correctly said that, you know, a morphologically abnormal sperm may, may have the chromosomal incompetency. But suppose if there is a genetic uh, um, incompetency, does it mean that it is only affect the teratozoospermic man or it is affecting the normozoospermic man and the oligozoospermic man too? Exactly, exactly. Because if if uh, the, the genetic impairment is there, chromosomal abnormality is there, it may be uh, not linked to that particular, uh, I have seen, I, I used to do lots of, uh, of, you know, DNA fragmentation tests at that time, I have seen like the morphology abnormal cell may, is, is showing, it's a, you know, green in the, uh, in, I mean, the, it's not fragmented, like it may happen in normal spermic sample also, like the sperm is showing very good, it's maybe decisive, it may be the chromosome uh, is not uh, in the proper shape and that's why the you know embryogenesis will be hampered but again i have showed that like the embryogenesis process has some of its own mechanism system mechanism that to uh, repair that particular one so uh, it's again the female will uh, choose which one is going yeah. ahead yes yeah. yeah thank you para uh Vijayji, thanks would you like to ask third question Thank you very much for that uh, explanation and people should really uh, realize the fact that there is a correlation though there is a correlation between the morphology and the uh, genetics but sometimes it may be inversely that means the morphologically normal looking sperm also may have you know genetic uh, defects uh, coming to you uh, dr akash what do you think are the there are criteria to select or modify the sperm preparation techniques because how we prepare this, these uh, uh, sperms, a lot of uh, things depends upon how, what is the probability of us getting uh, the fertilizable sperms. So, can you, so show, can you throw some light on this, uh, Akash? Oh, yeah. Thank you for the question, uh, Mangali sir and Chalatman. So, I would like to say that the first thing what we want over here is a sperm which is live. The first and foremost thing could be I think as a live sperm, which is what is required over for the injection. So that is the first criteria over there for us to, you know, select any sperm. Next would be once we exceed that number, uh, the number of oocytes to which are present to be injected, then our preparation techniques, and it is then uh, that our selection techniques will kick in. So when, uh, when it is say a case of a severe azoospermia uh, or a severe cryptozoospermia, might be the selection and preparation will be to a minimal where you know the only thing left would be to do a simple wash 
most of the times with cryptozoospermia, we take for a couple of samples, repeat the sample, might be the sperm is not sufficient. The second sample might be better. And especially ongoing with the DFI, uh, if I may call it a fad or the recent evolution in terms of DFI, uh, we are seeing that the second sample has a lower DFI content. So with that, the second sample, especially when there is a high DFI. Next, uh, the basic parameters, coming back to the basic parameters, your sperm concentration, your sperm volume, your motility and morphology. These are going always to be the first go-to parameters where you'll be analyzing. And uh, we have fortunately or unfortunately, uh, we have a discontinuous density gradient along with the swim up, which has turned out to be the gold standard for nearly three decades. I mean, right from where I've started to learn about the things, it has remained and continues to remain the gold standard in terms of cost, efficacy, efficiency, speed, everything in terms of learning the ease of learning. So discontinuous density gradient remains the first go-to technique and that is the one which I personally prefer to prepare the sperm. Next would be, we can you know always tweak it. It's not that you, know, uh, you have always a 1500 RPM, 2000 RPM, 15 minutes. It's not that it has, always has to be constant. You can always change that whenever you the concentration changes or the viscosity increases or decreases, you can always increase the, concentrate, uh, the RPM and the time as well. So you are trying to trickle out that extra few sperms over there. Might be the sperm which is slightly sluggish in motility but carrying a better morphology. Next, uh, the common techniques that we use in terms of sperm preparation is one is discontinuous density gradient. Your simple wash, like I said, in cryptozoospermia, where you can increase the centrifugation times. And third one would be the microfluidics, uh, the chips what we use. They are designed usually for cases where uh, you'll be doing uh, when the count is more than in excess of 10 million. That is what they recommend most of the chips manufacturers, 10 million with a good motility. So good active motility is required. So obviously the moment you, uh, keep these parameters, you are ruling out the male factor over there. So for microfluidics. So what we are doing in microfluidics, we are trying to select when we have the excessive sperm with us, rather than when we are having the low number. And last but not the least, I would say in terms of max, uh, max, it will give you a very reduced recovery rate, especially when there is a debris is present. So in such cases, you have to decide whether you want to go in for max or not. Uh, I have done few cases of max where it was less than 1 million as well. Uh, you get that occasional sperm, you just give a concentrate, you spin it after you get the sample and you just directly lift it from the pellet. And in cases of severe roads, max definitely works to a good extent, especially when they have high DFI. And uh, one drawback of max, what I've seen is some cases it has a red to reduced motility. So that is like if you're planning for a conventional IVF, then in that case, it might be an issue. So these are the common things in terms of sperm preparation techniques. I have not uh, gone into the sperm selection techniques. And uh, one more most important parameter would be what is the technique that you are going to apply to them? Whether it is the IUI you are doing, IVF or ICSI, what is it that you are planning to do with the sample? That would be the first and foremost for me. Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you think, what may be the reason for the reduced motility when you use MAX, Akash? Uh, the nano beads which probably interfere in the magnetic uh, the point one Tesla field which we are exposing the sperm to probably that is the one we do give two washes to remove it but I don't think that uh, gets removed to a good extent uh, probably that is the reason I am assuming that may be the reason why it is it has not become very very popular method as such for you know right. method um, Charota next yeah uh, uh, so, sorry for interruption sir yeah. uh, Vijay sir and Charu ma'am uh, yeah. Dr. Shubhangi and Dr. Vedas um, ask to add something for this because they've raised their hands for this. Okay. Yeah, please. So my question uh, to uh, Dr. Prag Nandi, as he showed that in one slide, that there is a, uh, you know, repairing method for Usai. So don't you think when uh, we are selecting that uh, bad sperm or what are territorial sperm, sperm, bad morphology sperm, and we inject in that, and yes, of course, there, there is a repair, a repair mechanism over there. It, it will repair. But will it not affect the as such quality of embryo? I don't know. Uh, that's uh, my question, actually. Yes. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Ved, uh, you correctly said, because uh, see, in everyday practice, we always try to find out the best sperm, best uh, morphologically uh, you know, normal sperm, we always try to inject. And that is what uh, we uh, 
do during ICSI. But in case of, uh, you know, severe tear to just by Mia, we had to do because in those cases, when we, uh, you know, we have no other option, uh, you may, you, you see the 0%, uh, you know, good morphologically sperm you can see on screen. At that time, we had to do this kind of uh, ICSI. And I have found like, uh, you know, little fragmentation, uh, you know, increased fragmentation I have seen, but it mainly affected the ultimate uh, faith in all the time. I won't say that every time we have found very good pregnancy, that is not is happening. That is not the case in ART. But in, in generally, what is the, uh, what we get in everyday practice, like even normal sperm also, we are injecting and we're getting very good embryo and may not be, uh, you know, getting pregnancy or maybe, uh, you know, the embryo fragmentation is increased in case of very good sperm. But I have found like, uh, if you are seeing that, you know, if you have very bad morphologically, uh, head is abnormal. And those things need to be very much taken care of because the meat piece in any anyways, uh, you know, not all the time like the uh, any any uh, it doesn't affect when I am doing ICSI, but uh, definitely definitely we need to see because uh, but papers are also saying like the birth defects are not that much in in those cases they have found uh, we uh, we we need to be very much cautious about that but. The, definitely the embryo quality uh, not that good if you are injecting the uh, you know very bad looking bad morphology sperm but maybe it may be decisive that is what i wanted to uh, say like uh, it may not be the good sperm add something to good, good embryo yeah uh, dr kc has uh, something to ask he has raised yeah. his shall i go ahead with the yeah i just i just asked you one question because am i audible to all of you Yes, yes, please. Fine. See, basically, in every aspect of embryology, what we are doing is just observation, the morphological aspects. There is not a single biochemical parameter or a more biological parameter by which we are assessing the gametes. And it see as it states that once you break the zona or you once you break the ulema membrane, automatically the signaling mechanism will promote it to fertilize. We are manually injecting the sperm, howsoever bad the morphology will be. And if the morphology is bad, definitely of the head. Obviously, DNA content is compromised because in a mammalian sperm, the DNA is compacted six to ten times more. Excellent. Okay, so yeah. obviously, morphologically abnormal sperms are definitely gonna be having an abnormal chromosome content. But the initial part of fertilization will be achieved because it is ICSI we are manually injecting the sperm. So in ICSI, your fertilization waste will be par excellent. But what happens is subsequently down the line when we monitor the progresses, the development progresses or what we can say we grade the embryo as per the developing time scale. This is where we see a little dip in the occurring. So I think definitely from actually an embryologist's viewpoint as to how we see in the laboratory, forget the research and forget the papers because I never stick to them more because it doesn't mean that they have done an extensive study on some thousands of samples before coming to a conclusion. That's number one. So in a nutshell, if XC is done, even with an abnormal morphology sperm from an OAT, you are bound to get excellent percentage of fertilization. But subsequently, when you monitor it down the line, the cleavage rate, the grade one embryos definitely show a dip. This clearly relates that abnormal sperm definitely have a suboptimal chromosome content. That's my saying. Thank you. That's true. But critical, okay. uh, yeah, definitely, uh, Dr. Casey has said, like, but the, uh, the you know, uh, this kind of Kruger morphology strict criteria, uh, uh, while you are doing the ICSI and you are not seeing like, uh, you know, uh, you are putting that particular criteria, papers are saying, and I have seen also like the, it's very strictly if you are selecting the sperm and if you are not selecting the sperm, it's not possible even if you are doing the ICSI. But in IMSI, while I am doing that, I, I am choosing, but uh, Shubangi will emphasize on that. Uh, but, uh, but I have seen like the abnormal sperm, abnormal morphological sperm, uh, you know, little higher percentage of, uh, you know, uh, the fragmentation rate than the cleavage uh, quality. Uh, that's, those things uh, that's, ex that's exactly what that's I'm it. trying to tell that's you. Right. Because see, one cannot be sure as to how each gamete is going to behave. Yes. The best of the best embryos have given us zero result. The worst this of the worst yes. looking have given us the best results. So it is a game of a probability with a leeway on both the sides. Okay. 
because we cannot monitor the cellular damage or the cyto architectural changes which take place subsequently True. right and we don't know why we are doing xcs we are not monitoring the condition of the oocyte at the same time which in ivf is definitely monitored excellent sperm and the excellent egg so i think there is a quite a distance between the top and the mid fine carry on sir. yeah uh, my next question is for charuji uh, is he there yes i am here yeah <laughs> hello sir hello. Uh, charu asking charu <laughs> Yes. So uh, the question is the sperm preparation technique. I just want to know that what are the available uh, conventional as well as advanced sperm preparation technique and how do you select that which technique uh, when to use for the like uh, uh, for our uh, insemination or ICSI or whatever it is and uh, that's it. And how do we optimize the, its efficacy? Uh, so thank you for uh, such a brilliant question. Brilliant question. What I am saying because see the sperm is always an an big question mark in front of all of us from the beginning, and still we are struggling on sperm. Whether it is like uh, just uh, Parag was saying that the Kruger's criteria. I believe if we follow that Kruger criteria strictly, it is very difficult to get a normal sperm. It is not there at all. So anyway, coming to the this thing, sperm. Uh, I would like to uh, have some uh, points here clear, like the understanding of what we today. The problem is this that we just consider semen as an as a normal uh, substance which which has to be handled. It has to be handled by the way it has to be handled. So that one need to understand. So. What I would like to say here is that all semen samples, what we see, we just say that, okay, sample is collected, but the semen sample in itself, every sample is different from each other. If you see very minutely, it comes in different physiological state, it comes in different mindset, it comes with a good count, it comes with a low count, it comes with a high viscosity and all. So you have to see various things before selecting and sperm preparation technique. Of course, the why you are doing that sperm preparation for IUI or IVF, it's that comes second. But then all these parameters need to give concentration that, okay, this, this, these are the factors related with this, because this is a very common phenomenon. Every one of us agrees that on the day of requirement, the sample, how it is going to be here, we don't know. We may have a very good sample earlier in analysis, but on the particular day of procedure, we may have a very worse sample. And what is semen? Actually, what we are looking for sperm preparation in sperm preparation is through removing the good motile fraction of sperms, which is good fertilization potential, good quality. And that's why the semen is mainly considered with two parts. One is the sperm, which is uh, there, and other is the cellular and uh, liquid part of it, which comes mostly from the glandular secretions. And ultimate aim, as I said, is all procedure is to separate a good quality sperm. So now, as we go to techniques available, we have very traditional, this IUI sperm preparation for IUI has been done from last so many decades and it is a very common technique. Uh, so traditional techniques include SWIMAP, which we have um, listened earlier also. This is a basic technique which was offered earlier when there was no advanced techniques and all, uh, all semen samples used to swim. Now I am talking of that era when there, there, the RPM meter and uh, temperature and this was not in the picture actually. It was just a uh, uh, urine centrifuge machine. I have seen people send centrifuging one, two, three, four, five. not only people, even I used to do it in 93, 94 when, when it started. But now we are sophisticated centrifuge and all. So stream up is a, one of the basic traditional technique which was there and still it has been used in some places, but of course with some modifications, like we have a very limited centrifugation speed now to reduce the ROS generation to get the good quality. But this swim up is a normal technique, which is for a normal sperm we can apply. Then we have swim down or density gradient technique also. And I feel, and previously also it said density gradient is now in today's scenario is the gold standard it is a technique which has to be followed for all kind of semen samples where wherever it is required for iui or xc or ivf because i feel density gradient is the only technique right now which gives you without making much um, uh, modifications good fraction of motile sperms which can be used for the fertilization process and 
of course the density gradient we we have the selection criteria depending on uh, the molecular size and the uh, total morphology and also the last fraction which we get is a good quality sperm that is what is believed with the density gradient we have a single layer or double layer density gradient depending upon the presence of uh, debris in it if there is high amount of debris high amount of uh, other cellular material then we can even the count is good then we can go even for a central center single uh, layer also but the as i said gold standard is using double layer density gradient under layering this is another technique which was uh, there from the beginning and still some places it is used it uh, helps us in reducing the uh, roi generation it if there is no need to spin the sample you simply layer it under the um, media layer and you get the good quality motile sperm now other than this traditional technique now we have uh, advanced techniques like magnetic activated cell sorter just uh, it, uh, it it is explained very well microfluidics this is another technique which is coming up still i feel these techniques are under uh, the uh, process of uh, fine refinement and uh, it needs more work to be done on this uh, techniques to get used to our day to day practice as rightly said there is uh, limitations with this microfluidics cost involved in the process and the technique and all these things other than this we 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 have sometimes uh, problem with the sperm motility so we can use additional um, chemicals like pentoxyphylin to improve the motility the if we have a very high viscosity problem then we can go for the use of proteolytic enzyme for this and um, as we are saying high viscosity high amount of cellular debris large number of first cell which is a kind of uh, indication for infection also different sperm parameters oligoesthenoteratosis spermia infectious sample for hiv we i have heard that for hiv also we can uh, just spin it for two times or three times and we can reduce viral load to minimum extent and a normal uh, icsi procedure is possible with the uh, hiv positive sample also and uh, to optimize this process what we need to see is the centrifugal speed which is very important in all kind of procedures if it it has to be regulated to reduce the reactive oxygen species roi generation in the media and uh, our aim should be to get at the end of the procedure we should be able to get a neat and clean sample of iui i believe we we increase motility to 90% 95% from a uh, percentage of some 50 40 50 60 percent at the end of the preparation for iui and then timing of insemination why i mentioned here is that um, irrespective of your uh, good uh, preparation and good count and good motility and everything still pregnancy comparative comparatively pregnancy achievements are less or the success rate is less so i have find it out that the you have prepared the sample but the clinician is not ready and the sample is lying for half an hour or one hour after preparation they are with you that also cause problem and reduce in motility and can affect the result absolutely so it is very well you know you have covered all the points for the sperm preparation from basic to advanced from uh, room temperature to 37 and everything so uh, i don't think there is any question left over for anybody and if any things there uh is there any question or shall we go ahead with the second question i think we can go ahead and then we can yeah yeah sure so uh vijay ji on yeah all the points thank you charu for covering this this is what i meant by coming it from the experienced persons you know this is thank you, thank you sir this is it is it is really a, a thing to learn for all the uh, newcomers Uh, coming to the kursi kursi i know you this is your a uh, favorite uh, you know subject and you like to uh, elaborate and discuss it uh, you know the way we want it so just let let us know that what are the invasive and non invasive protocols in the sperm selections and where do they stand at present in our day to day practice well sperm selection now basically whenever we look at a sample we see into it and we say oh my gosh none of them are motile they are all non motile so the total in a one second second i just have the prior one okay, okay so is every non motile sperm branded as a dead sperm no it cannot be sensor 
Next, sir. The criteria is that all non-motile sperm can be branded as redundant unless the membrane integrity is judged. Now, to judge the membrane integrity, we have to check the various tests. Right now, membrane integrity could be a reason to a number of factors. It can be osmotic stress, mix cuts, cryofracture, pH imbalance, handling mechanisms, exposure to the seminal plasma. So all can result in a membrane trauma. And in any human cell, if the plasma membrane is compromised, the viability of the cell will be compromised, irrespective, howsoever excellent it may be looking in its non-motile way. So what we are doing is, that many a times in case of a home collection, we find the number of sperm are, can I have the next one? We find the number of sperm are non-motile. So what it could be? Which reason could we attribute it to? Was it a collection issue? Was it an exposure to the suboptimal container having a severe high amount of reprotoxicity or zero motility can be due to an occupational hazard of a rickshaw driver sitting for hours on hot rickshaw engines or cross-legged sitting with laptops on it? which can result in increased ROS. There can be micronutrition deprivation. There can be a smoker's issue in which there can be elevated nicotine levels leading to lazy cilia syndrome. The next one, sir. So what we do is we simply test the membrane integrity and how we tested the penetration effect. And what we do is we do with the negrosiniosin method because there are many methods of sperm selection, but I'm sorry to say not many are evidence-based indicators. It is a little if and a but, a this side or a that side. So this will help us know that which of the sperm are actually dead means non-functional. You may find the sperm in this, which are colorless, in which the eosin hasn't permeated, thereby not colored the cell. So all stained sperm will be non-functional. All unstained sperm, though non-motile, can't be branded as non-functional because they have lost the capacity to be motile because of the reasons which I explained prior. And obviously, all motile sperm will be colorless. They will be a bit alive and functional, though they might be morphologically abnormal. So these are two different issues which we have to filter out. And the sad part is no two semen samples are going to be the same even after an hour to hour collection. They are definitely going to confuse us. So thereby, we always say that one semen sample estimation is not an ideal parameter for us to judge the I would say androgenicity of the male. The next one, sir. So what we do? We are faced with a problem. We are doing an ICSI and we have got an OAT sample. Definitely an OAT sample means what? Either it's a residual sample in which we see an occasional sperm twitching or it is completely non-motile. Many a times OAT samples when they are spun or what we call it is as good as a cryptozoospermic where we have to fish out the sperm from the pellet. So whatever techniques and whatever methodologies we do, but when we are faced with a problem of having an OAT sample with all non-motile sperm, ultimately at the end of the day, we select. And with the question in ICSI for all, obviously we have no choice but to select and inject whatever we get. So how we go about it? Few sperm, sir, sorry, few sperm, totally non-motile, we select them to a host test. And this is the next test which will be indicating as the membrane integrity. The one which is coil, membrane integrity is intact. It is a viable sperm. So what the embryologist has to do is, if he has a facility of an MC, judge the morphology and especially select the morphology by the head. Or we have a further development, what we call as the pixie dish. Next one, sir. Now this is based on the hyaluronase binding efficacy. Now there is still a lot of plethora of doubts between the positives and the negatives of it. Extensive research in hyaluronic binding efficacy has proved that it is not that much indicative as much morphology is because what their basic idea in the mind till today is the more the normal the sperm, the better is the genetic compacted DNA in it. So the clinical predictive value of hyaluronic binding efficacy and sperm fertilizing obesity is very much limited. Compared to the morphological aspects, how much it is related, this takes a little downtrend. So I would definitely suggest, if not going by the Strix criteria or the Kruger's criteria, because it is intricate. And sometimes when we are faced with the problem of having just 4% of normal sperm in a pool of sample in the most fertile male, it confuses and it creates more difficult scenario for us. So in a nutshell, next one, sir. Yes. So what is actually the role in sperm? Now, when we are doing the pixie, 
it will be just mimicking as the affinity of the sperm to actually attach to it. So the more rich or the more viable the sperm as far as its chemical constituents are concerned will indicate probably that this sperm has a little higher chance of providing an optimal embryo post an optimum fertilization. But still enough information is not available to prove the efficacy in PICSI technique over the ICSI couples. Now in ICSI, what we are doing is though human eye is not the ideal parameter to judge the morphology, I would prefer having a proper IMSI because IMSI also has got multiple parameters stated. One vacuole, multiple small vacuoles, large vacuolation, multiple mix. And there also it is stated that it is not going to improve your success rate, but it is definitely going to provide you with a good embryo after which in the abortion rates are comparatively down. Next one, sir. Now, the only parameter, of course, though it is still not 100% evidence-based, which can go into a depth of an incellular level is the DNA fragmentation. Now, is it an actual evidence-based indicator or is it just to give us an idea that the genetic material encapsulated in the acrosome is not optimal? Now, the problem is that this technique, next one, sir, involves, next one, yes. Now, this is a little towards the protein core and the chromatin formation. Now, how we implement this technique, there are, next one, sir, there are different methods. Can I go ahead? Can you go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Now, this is important because genetic integrity of both the sperm and the oocytes is essential for normal embryonic development. And embryonic development is not on a certain day when we observe. It is progressing or cascading with relation to the time period. So that is what we call it as an embryonic developmental scale which is better made available to us in the time lapse. Agreed, high DNA fragmentation rates correlated with miscarriage and reduced pregnancy rates. So what does this tell? That DNA containing in the abnormal sperm being compromised, it is responsible for the miscarriages. DNA fragmentation obviously seen in poor sperm samples with our samples with poor parameters. DNA fragmentation also seen in men with normal sperm parameters. So it is not, it is eluding the normal sperm. It is present, but the fraction or the percentage of the test, the percentage of the fragmentation in a normal sample might not be that much. It is not crossing the threshold value. So DNA fragmentation represents a cause for male fertility. Now, this is not obviously revealed by our normal semen analysis. Like in, say, a diabetic patient, excellent count, excellent motility, excellent morphology. Still, many a times in IVF, we find field fertilization because there lies in the root. It affects the actual genome. And ultimately, when an embryo is formed, the fusion of the male and the female, the formation of the genome post 50 hours of development, six to eight cell stage, causes an increase in the sustainability of the embryo which makes it progressively go towards the blastosis and increases its chance in implantation. The next one, sir. Yeah. Now, what is abnormal chromatin packaging? Due to altered histone to protamine ratio, chromatin compaction is compromised. DNA damage can be there. Fertilizing capacity can be damaged. Protein deficiency is linked to defective spermatogenesis. And unfortunately, there is no remedy for abnormal chromatin packaging. It is irreversible, damage to the DNA. Now, therein, we have to take an advantage of the fact that a percentage, how much percentage of the sperm are affected. But that will again depend upon the volumetrics, the count. So everything in andrology is in percentages. We cannot select. So what we got to do is, a different, a same person delivering samples at different time, we have to do the sets repeatedly. Unfortunately, that also is not possible because ultimately at the end of the day, it's commercial aspect. It should be affordable to the patient also. And it is not that a person who has got a high DNA fragmentation rate will not conceive many a times. They show spontaneous consumption within two to three months. And actually the reports which we tell them and our counseling which was done to them we are made a laughing stock at times. Can I have the next one, sir? 
So this is what is responsible, basically, the oxidative stress. Excessive oxidative stress in the ROS levels, pathological to the sperm, where they are generated. So when the question was mentioned in the centrifugation, this is equally important because high rates of centrifugation greater than 300 G is definitely tormenting to the membrane of the sperm, which will lie. Not only for the sperm, the other cells present in the semen, they lies, they rupture, and they remove their obnoxious content into the medium, which coats the DNA, I mean, which coats the sperm membrane. And sperm membrane is a fantastic affinity. So when they are super saturated with this, obviously the fertilization potential dips down. And what was more important, which everybody has missed, that post collection of a sample, it is necessary that we have to eliminate the seminal plasma as early as possible. Because certain articles by Dr. David Mortimer has critically stated that if a semen sample post collection is kept for more than half an hour, the fertilizing capacity of the sperm dip by as much as 80%. Because in many labs, we have a nasty habit of saying, oh, sir, satme kar pun. No, it's not like that. Eliminate the seminal plasma. Seminal plasma post ejaculation is a culprit. Whereas seminal plasma in natural conception is a boon because it insulates the acrosome against the acidic vaginal secretions, thereby preventing the sperm DNA from getting denatured. So when a large quantity of ROS is produced, sperm DNA damaged by oxidative stress, they can be treated with medications. But still, what we are doing is, can I have the next slide, sir? We are having this different test. Now, what makes this DNA fragmentation more difficult is the number of tests are there. Majority of them involve staining. There are tiny errors of human creeping. The way the halos are interpreted, the way they are counted, the ripeness of the stain, the freshness of the stain, the intensity of the stain, or the control slides. Can I have the next one? So this is exactly what is happening because it's a membrane lysis. Once the lysis is there, chromatin decondenses, and that forms a halo. Now, according to me, this can be bad. I mean, this can be good, but according to somebody else, it can be very good. So this is the difference in interpretation. A slight value plus minus 10% can be tolerable, but it is all upon the person who does it. It is all upon the gadget which he uses. It's all upon the stain which he uses and all upon the kit which he uses. The next one, sir. Now, this is a comparison which I've drawn. Different things. Difficult, easy, availability, time. Procedure is long, procedure is short the involvement of allied apparatus like a refrigerator, the hot bath. So this is all what we are trying to do is we are not trying to assure anything that this is the best way we can select the best sperm. Howsoever methods are available, the ideal sperm is still elusive. It is a literal luck factor. But what we are trying to do is we are trying to narrow down our search towards the retrieval of the sperm. Now, as I said, Okay, whenever a collection is done, if a gentleman misses the first quote of the ejac ejaculation, obviously 40% of the most mortal fraction is lost. And if it is not reported, what we do? We go ahead by the availability of the sample. You got my point. Next one, sir. Yeah, so which one is the best? Well, it is up to you. This I have just listed as per the available general literature, but the bullet number three is very important. Best method is yet to be determined. Tunnel may be better because it measures directly. It is comparatively quicker, the sperm chromatin decondensation, easier, and it is more cost effective. The next one, sir. Well, how you are going to manage it? General question, as in many of the problems or pathologies, bless you. It is, bless you. So it is ROS mediated, antioxidants, lifestyle, or severe cases where there is no chance of it. XC at higher magnification or the best is MC. But let's not remember the fact we are dealing with cytology. We are dealing with two cells. The largest cell of the body and the most sensitive cell, that's the oocyte, and the smallest and the most motile cell of the sperm, both of whose intricacies are unknown to us. Because still date, whatever we have been observing them, filtering them, debating upon them, suggesting for them, is all upon the morphological appearance. We eat an embryo, we eat a sperm, we eat a leucite, we eat a blastocyst. The next one, sir. Well, I think I continue this also in this. I'll share this is a separate topic. 
is i think separate one so that we can move it with uh, fine okay so this was these are we'll okay yeah yeah i think this are all this is for the chromosomal abnormalities which come in right. now definitely chromosomal abnormalities will be present is there the first one for chromosomal abnormalities sir sorry is it the first one for the chromosomal abnormality no. ah this yeah this ah uh, this one yes now this is an another challenge chromosomes are responsible now of course when you say chromosomes you mean genes and when you say genes it's genetics so this is small genetics so chromosomal aberrations number wise or functional wise they both have their effect on fertility frequency of chromosomal aberrations is 0.6 however certain types they shoot up in certain diseases now what is responsible for that dna damage and chromosomal aberrations go hand in hand right and it is not that all the male sperm are totally free like suppose when you also do an embryo biopsy or a blastocyst biopsy we cannot be sure that all the cells if a thing comes normal they are totally free a certain percentage of the cells are obviously affected by errors during cell division what we call it as meiosis in the testes so every healthy semen sample of howsoever fertile a man may be will be having a certain percentage of sperm which will show chromosomal abnormalities the next one sir so how we are screening them initial yeah it's correct sir it's correct so it's chronic cvs sampling amniocentesis but both of them carry a certain bit of a risk now chromosomal abnormalities done in case of a family history elderly ladies now just as we do the triple marker test in ladies delivering 35 years plus next one sir then coming back to this max i think this will be covered in the, with the, by the next uh, okay fine not an issue sir so according to me even this is yeah if this this is related with max sir this is the max topic the yeah. last four slides are of max okay fine so what that... are the plus points minus points principle and the negative points okay. these are the drawbacks for max fine okay thank you thank you i have one question but i'll ask you afterwards sure jalata please go ahead with this one yeah uh, so uh, shubhangi are you there Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, I'm so my, in the lab. I'm extremely sorry. No problem. Yeah. Uh, my question is that uh, what is the role of IMC in case of the sperm selection? Like, uh, just to highlight, what are the indications where you uh, prefer doing IMC? So first and the foremost, I would say uh, I would like to do IMC if the sperms. have high levels of dna fragmentation if you have done a dna fragmentation test and uh, it is more than 50% uh, result is dna frag uh, sperm dna fragmentation is seen we would definitely like to do mc then uh, also with men with severe uh, oats oligosaccharidosperm semen samples but more importantly i would like to do it in uh, repeated abortions or if the patient has a history of miscarriage or if uh, there is a failed fertilization in uh, the patient from the previous ics so that would be the reason to do uh, mc honestly but yeah that's about it yeah. as far as the efficacy is concerned mm. efficacy uh well uh, vijay we all have been working in this field for a very long time <laughs> there have been a lot of uh, studies rcts done and uh, there is no current evidence which says that imc uh, the evidence is the rcts will not support nor refute the use of mc honestly because uh, there isn't any additional uh, benefit from the use of mc it is extremely time consuming the sperm processing techniques are now so uh, easy and uh, they would more or less uh, we should be able to eliminate the abnormal sperms 
there were some studies. Is there any sperm classification system available uh, to literature or to research that uh, to find the good quality sperm through MC? Like suppose, uh, how do we categorize? How do we classify our embryo? Is there any classification from the sp sperm that vacuoles like this, multiple vacuoles? So do we have some classification system? Classification, honestly, I have not used MC in practical purposes in last so many years that I've been working and uh, I have been doing HC almost day in, day out. So I'm not very sure of uh, how good or bad it is. So I'm sorry, I'm not, una I'm not able to answer this particular question of yours, Charu. Yeah. Uh, KC, sir, you are... Yeah, I think uh, MC definitely, it didn't jack up the pregnancy rates. It was, its target was that the embryo made from an MC selected sperm was supposed to be a little better in an OAT sample compared to the rest. So it was like selecting a devil from the devils. And what was noted was that the abortion rates with those embryos formed from OAT samples were comparatively less in which MC was used. But still, there is no concrete hardcore evidence, so I cannot say crossing my heart, can no MC is the best. It is one of a technique which will help us improvise the selection of the sperm. Beyond Ketsi. that, yeah. yeah. I agree with you, Ketsi, but the thing is, if you are doing, say, two, three, four ICSIs in a day with yes. eggs, numbers like 10, it's not possible. It's not possible. 20, it is impossible to do MC on each and every egg and you know honestly it's so time consuming and whatever videos or uh, knowledge i have about that you need technically you need a glass uh, dish yes the, 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 and, uh, the requirements yeah, are huge the images yeah the, the requirements, requirements are, are different. huge very yes, true yes yes the only thing is magnification is 6000 times more but well if you are doing it day in and day out uh, you are also not going to be having so much of error in selecting the sperm. And there have been studies which shows that one or two amorphous uh, no, no. you know, vacuoles in the heads uh, are, are they really would, harmful? No, no, I would just what like to think? debate on this point that what we observe, even in the maximum magnification of our X inverted microscope, the MC mm. definitely justifies more about the intracellular region. The microvacuoles will not be seen even in the 1000 magnification of our stereosome. So definitely the intracyto architecture is improved. No doubts about that. But, but how that many is, vacuoles are okay? That, that's exactly that is mentioned. Yeah. Even in that it is mentioned that one or two micro is tolerable. Doesn't Multiple matter, tiny yeah. mid-like vacuoles surrounding the complete acrosomal periphery is bad. One major That's what I was depression. asking. Is there any classification that? Think, uh, yes, yes, yes. I think it is there. I think we it is there. It is there. It. There are four classifications. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, still, anything can upset the queen. So it is like we are <laughs> really not sure because we are not exactly aware of the DNA content. Now, whether that affects the DNA content or not is another question. We are seeing a morphological aberration. But is that morphological aberration directly linked to the DNA? Are the DNA directly linked to the chromosome abnormality? The answers are endless. Yes, it is a tool. It is a tool. It helps us satisfy and it you helps us what, provide. You know what? The place where I'm working right now, they say it's a nice toy to play with. One of my so every, colleagues every, says it's a nice every, toy. To every play technology with. is a toy as long as the yes. toy delivers better result. See, the thing yes. is that even True. in the sperms, I have seen, you know, up to 40 to 50 percent of the, those sperms they show the vacuoles and after yes. that only i have started you know minimizing the use of the mc so that's a different aspect thank Absolutely. you very much, thank you for that you know uh, beautiful question that is uh, being asked so yeah. Yalata, this is the next question yeah again uh, the question my is to uh, for charuji that uh, uh, as we are know that microfluidics is one of the thing to, you know, we are using in our embryology laboratory for the sperm preparation. Okay. So what are the indications uh, where we are supposed to use microfluidics? Of course, few we have discussed earlier. And how do you feel that what is the present status of this microfluidics sperm preparation and sperm selection in today's era? Yeah. <clears throat> as I... Um... Uh, uh, I'm not very much using these techniques in my day-to-day -day practice as I feel that uh, 
till we need to wait for more data to come on and uh, to prove its efficacy and uh, practical aspects of these techniques. But the indications for use of this is like we ROS generation, we already discussed that it is one of the major factors which cause the sperm damage. So uh, this is one uh, low sperm count. We can select the sperm out of it. Functional spermatozoa, which has good motility, which has good forward progression, which has good morphology, that selection can be done with this. And uh, ultimately, it is uh, the, the person performing that procedure can have less number of errors in terms of selecting the sperm or morphology. That is what is the indications of this. Uh, presently, I know uh, it's very few people are using this technique, but wherever it has been used, they have given a positive response that, uh, yes, it, it works and it helps us in improving the fertilization potential. But as far as uh, uh, pregnancy rates are concerned, I don't have much data on it from, I'm talking on Indian scenario, right, where we are uh, working here in India. So here, how many people are using and all. So uh, I think it is cost factor is also one of the important uh, reason now, now in today's scene where it is not that commonly used because it involves the cost. Commercially, it is very well available in the market. Various manufacturers are representing it. And uh, right now, as far as IUI is concerned, I don't think in IUI they are uh, very widely used, but yes, for IVF and ICSI, they, they may be for selected patient it is used in India now, the present scenario. That's true, Jaro. I'm using uh, this one, but there are certain limitations to this, definitely. One, as you rightly said, that it is difficult for for us to use it for IUI purpose because the volume that you get it, it's so less that it can, cannot be used. And the second thing that I, I have observed is that uh, generally the 24 hours survival after some of the, you know, indications. Exactly. Is they are very poor and uh, th I contacted those uh, um, principles and then we are working on it. Uh, so I think this is still under the... Um, and do you feel that DNA uh, fragmentation is getting reduced? Have you any done a study that DNA fragmentation before preparation and the after preparation? That is what they... microfluidics, uh, yeah. Can I interrupt, ma'am? Sir, can I interrupt? Yeah, sure. See, basically, <laughs> as the name suggests, microfluidics means it is passage of a medium or passage of a sperm through a very narrow pathway under pressure. Now, this I don't think will work very well in case of asthenozoospermic samples. Exactly. Where the motility is there, I don't think this is successful. And what it targets is okay, the sperm showing an excellent motility characteristic by dynamically going through the crypts and the crevices mm -hmm. is the best sperm. The idea of DNA fragmentation, I don't think that the two parameters gel over exactly. here. So what they are selecting is a sperm with the best motility, maybe having a proper integrity because motility depends upon the package of the it sperm, the of sperm the the mitochondrial sheet from which the ATP produce whiplash motion to the tail effect to stroke recovery stroke. So this is exactly what microfluidics is, is transportation technology through an area under pressure. Yeah. The narrow the pressure, more the area, the better the sperm will zoom. So right. it is like we are selecting based on the category of kinetomatics. Exactly. I think so. Claim yeah, but the, the uh, just minimize just because you avoid the centrifugation step. Exactly. Yes, That's yes, very yes, so. yes. But yeah. I think centrifugation yeah. does play a very important part, provided it is controlled and it is properly executed. Nothing but even in the microfluidics, little skillfulness is required because otherwise it is getting blocked. Yes, yes, and yes. Another point is there because microfluidic separation can only select or only uh, discard the single strand breaking, breaking of the DNA, but double strand breaking uh, DNA containing sperm, they can pass through. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Absolutely true. Correct. Thanks. So moving on the next question, please, uh, Vijayji. Yeah, okay. Sure. You want me to uh, take this? Fine. Yes. So, Dr. Adnan, this is for you. Yes. No, this is apoptosis. Yes, apoptosis. Yeah. Uh, yes uh, we are almost surrounded by the apoptotic factor, but you know, apoptosis is a highly conserved, genetically controlled process. So it eliminates the bad uh, cell, the defective, genetically defective cell, the, such as spermatozoa during um, spermatogenesis in the testicle. Uh, but and uh, when it takes the upper hand, when there are a lot of apoptotic factor, then definitely it is harmful. 
such as you know that now it is lot of environmental toxicants uh, such as bisphenol uh, the plastic material actually phthalate uh, the nitro benzene uh, which is a component of the pesticide rubber etc the ethanol chemotherapeutic drugs all these they can initiate the apoptotic pathway and moreover during uh, if there is constant hyperthermia hypoxia such as in vericocil that also induce uh, uh, apoptosis and uh, uh, any factor that create oxidative stress any disease that cause high generation of ROS that cause apoptosis and uh, uh, but as it eliminate the damaged cell the genetically abnormal cell definitely it helps to uh, just uh, try to eliminate uh, the uh, abnormal paternal genome not to transfer to the female gamete um, uh, so in that way it helps in embryogenesis but you know that in case of severe male factor infertility when we have to uh, choose the ICSI or we have to choice the sperm by ourselves uh, for fertilization, there is high chance of fertilization by the apoptotic sperm. And apoptotic sperm usually have high level of DNA fragmentation, compromised genetic integrity. And so there is, uh, it may uh, lead to abnormal embryo formation, early embryo death. So there may be miscarriage, pregnancy loss, as well as birth defect in the offspring and so that, uh, therefore we should be very much careful when we are handling the semen in the lab uh, we should not expose the semen to extreme hot or cold atmosphere we should not wait for more than 90 minutes mm -hmm. but dr karsi told that according to david mortimer uh, it is it should be not more than half an hour but we have to wait for half an hour for liquefaction at least and uh, there may be chances of apoptosis and uh, the whole handling should be in an aseptic way. Moreover, we should be very much careful not to expose the semen into some chemicals such as hydrogen peroxide. If it is exposed in some way, there are a lot of ROS generation will be there. And during centrifugation, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, uh, Karsi and Dr. Charu already explained nicely that now uh, we have to be very much careful about the timing uh, of the centrifugation, speed of centrifugation that uh, should be done. And moreover, we should not incubate the post wash sperm for a long time at 37 degrees centigrade in the incubator. That may cause DNA uh, fragmentation and apoptosis. And uh, uh, method to evaluate apoptosis in sperm uh, yes, uh, uh, it, it was discussed already. Magnetic activated cell sorting or MATS, uh, where uh, we have to use uh, the paramagnetic microbid uh, conjugated with annexin B. Uh, you know, the uh, earliest feature of apoptosis is the externalization Systop. of yes. phosphatidyl serine, and annexin B is the uh, uh, phospholipid binding protein. So all the apoptotic sperm will be separated and we are getting the non-apoptotic sperm. But before that, definitely we have to prepare the sperm by density gradient technique. And that way we can separate the non-apoptotic spermatozoa for injection and another way by flow cytometry where we can um, estimate the caspase uh, enzyme level, caspase 3, caspase 8, mainly caspase 3 and P53 uh, protein, etc. Uh, but it is it is very costly, and all the ERT center they do not have this facility. But by this way, we can definitely separate the non-apoptotic sperm for ICC. Right. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much you. for a nice uh, explanation. I said. Thanks. Exactly. Yeah. 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 coming yes, from you again. <laughs> yeah. What is the role of the sperm motility and its kinetics? Well, Karsi, my sincere request, squeeze your answer within five to six minutes. I know you have so much to tell us. But <laughs> you will keep a space Anyways, sir, so can you share my... I think, sir, within, within, within say, 30 seconds, you change the slide. Okay? <laughs> Fine. Okay. So now, basically, a sperm motility and its importance 
is like having a Rolls Royce without petrol. Okay, this is how I would judge it as. Because the sperm motility doesn't mean that they just have to shake and make the embryologist happy that the percentage is this. Because the thing is, they have to swim over distances which are 10,000 times their own length. They have to travel the huge way before they reach the egg. An approximate distance of 18 centimeters from the cervix, that is till the fallopian tubes. The distance is huge. Now, though an ejaculate speed is 28 miles per hour of a male, but still, the motility depends upon not only the capacity to move, but the pattern in which they move, that is the linearity, then the angle of yawing, the way in which they move. Now, the speed being approximately 5 millimeters per minute, and they have to pass through the various layers of cervical mucus and also have to encounter the contractions, because in the initial phase, there is a sucking effect. When the intercourse is there, the sperm are sucked in. But later on, they are making the reasons or they are getting the resistance. So what is the need for kinetomatics? Literally, cervical mucus filters out the sperm. Perfect. But in our case, in ART, what we are substituting the cervical mucus is by our media, salt-saturated hippies-based media. Now, as the ovulation approaches, the sperm become capacitated and hyperactivated. And when they swim towards the tubal ampulla, this is where they meet resistance so they are, they are worn out as far as energy is concerned. The numbers are depleted because of abnormal ones are already filtered. So this is guided to the oocyte by a chemotaxic and a thermotaxic effect. The next one, sir. Now this is the passage. Passage is huge. Number of obstacles, filtering capacity. So ultimately from the 10 which are deposited over here, four to five actually meet that target. So the resistance which they have to play, it is at that time that the multiple avenues of kinetics are put into play. The linearity, the wavelength of the uh, meat frequency of the tail, the effective stroke, the recovery stroke, and all depends upon the package of mitochondria which are uh, giving the ATP. Now see, majority of the parameters have remained the same. Even the progressive motility from 50, which was in 87, it was dropped to 30. But the challenging aspect is the normal form. So I would think that today in selecting the good sperm, what we have to target is the shape because the shape is inadvertently related with the DNA packaging content. And till a time we don't exactly invent a test as to which will quantify the DNA, we will be at a loss. Now this is the TASA method of motility. And this is our routine. Nowadays it is progressive and non-progressive. And I have mentioned the speeds with which the uh, sperm travel. Now remember, this is under ideal lab conditions, what they meet or how they meet with the resistance of the mucus can definitely be a uh, deteriorating factor as far as the motility is concerned. The next one, sir. Now we all know how we grade depending upon the progression forward. Now this progression also will depend upon the morphology. If it's an abaxial placement, this Charlie is not going to go ahead. It will keep on going round and round. So the placement, the morphology, the dynamics, so what it is, we are studying is a fluid dynamics, the pathway, the linear pathway, depending upon the quality of the mucus, because it's a resistance they are going. So this sperm motility refers to the moment and poor the sample, it is called as asthenozoospermia, which is quite common in the phenomena OAT. The next one, sir. Now, all active motile are not linear, but all linear sperm have to be actively motile. Because as we saw in the prior talks, there are pathways. There is curvilinear velocity. There is VAP velocity. There is the deviation from the mean pathway. And every sperm never travel. They may take a curve pathway, but the displacement from the mean line of velocity is the most important key. The next one, sir. Now, this is exactly what is linearity. How much the tail deviates from the initial pathway to how much of a distance. Now, this is a simple fragment bit. This is the wavered beat pattern. Now, this is exactly the amplitude of lateral head displacement with relation to the track width. Now, this is all dynamics, fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics depend upon the body, which is in a dynamic motion, depending upon the resistance, which is faced from the factor. Then these are the swimming trajectories. So trajectory, how much we are able to distinguish on our routine microscope. We, we observe the tail lashing, the head wiggling, the effective stroke, recovery stroke. And based on this, we can judge the importance of the mitochondrial sheath, which is releasing the ATP. So here comes the temperature effect. 
hypothermia and hypothermia, both are detrimental. Ideal activation starts from 34 to 37. Then there are propulsion dynamics or the navigation. Even this rio taxic was discussed by the in our prior speakers. Now, this is all depending upon the ion channel influx. So when capacitation is better, geotoxic is improvised. And when geotoxicity is improvised, the pathway with the pressure with which they negotiate through the cervical mucus and the contents is improvised. The next one, sir. Now, this is a physical effect. Now, what happens? This is important. First, the sperm align themselves against the flow direction and swim upstream. This is called geotaxis. This geotax is a passive process dominated by fluid mechanics. And it is always remaining conscious. But what is affecting? Ion channel activation, the influx, the next one, sir. And most important is yawing. Yawing is a phenomena. A body travels in a straight line, but one plane always keeps on changing the plane. This is how we see the sperm head moving. Sometimes there is negative yawing. These sperms sometimes move backwards. So the propulsion, depending upon the linearity, the thrust, plus the dynamics of the head movement, like a ship sailing, the propulsion is given by the oh. propeller. But ultimately, it's the captain who controls the steering and moves the pathway of the propeller, which direction I want to go. You got it? So, yeah, so this is what it is. So a tightly packed mitochondria, what it has, perfect potential. Okay. There's a cross communication between somebody anyway. So motility represents one of the major determinants in male fertility. The sperm mitochondria associated with a cysteine-rich protein is suggested to be having a stabilizing role. Next one, sir. Allied role of the mitochondrial proteins. Now, unfortunately, this is all related to a thesis level investigations or research level. This cannot be duplicated into the laboratory, both whether we say it or not. Similarly, like flow cytometry. So what are the essentials? Eliminate the seminal plasma, prevent the overexposure, correct? Besides motility impairment, even fertilizing capacity is compromised, ideal improvement, good quality buffers, select the technique, centrifugation time, incubation time, handling technique, disposables. So hypo and hypothermia, and that is of course the use of your best incubators because in sperm, what we are using is a non-carbon dioxide clean incubator because of the HEPIS non-consistency with carbon dioxide. So this is it, sir. I think that should be my last slide. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Kasi. I think I had to zoom it up. I, you did it nicely. It was a precise uh, explanation. Thanks. Yes, sir, Chris. So, uh, yeah, Akash, uh, now, nowadays we are doing, you know, surgical sperm collection for variety of reason. But this particular question is, in case of the azuspermia, we are doing the sperm surgical, uh, surgical sperm collection. So what is your preference? Do you prefer doing uh, surgical sperm collection on the day of OPU or the day before the OPU or in the previous cycle? That's my question number one for you. Akash, is he there? Uh, no, in, Akash, in, Akash isn't here. So Shubhangi, would you like to answer this question? I, yeah, so generally, uh, surgical sperm retrieval, we uh, initially we used to do it on the day of uh, OPU, but now because I've moved uh, to this country, your the procedure generally is that uh, the PISA and TISA, all the procedures are done beforehand, before the uh, ovum pickups, and the samples are frozen always and uh, then later on the samples are thawed on the day of OPU and they are actually processed on a gradient depending upon how the sample was uh, before uh, freezing. So as and you have experienced uh, processing fresh and frozen sample both as you told, do you feel any difference in outcome with uh, use of fresh or frozen uh, surgical sperm collected sperm? Uh, I have uh, done both and I don't see any difference that is as per the convenience and the protocol that is being followed by a particular clinic by the andrologist by the uh, clinician by the embryology team so I don't see any difference really okay. but so, do you see that the samples give you the same results as uh, like the fresh samples uh, uh, Shubhangi over here they really give the same results I would say in UK where I'm working right now. So 
the recovery of pizza pizza frozen sperms is really very very good over here great so yes so what is your uh, processing method uh, and how do you handle uh, that kind of and you know take the chunks of the testicular tissue it is gives you kind of sticky things so how do you get rid of that how, what is your processing uh, centrifugation method? density gradient and centrifugation is what we follow over here okay okay yeah. can i interrupt sir ah uh, yes yeah But, see initially as dr shubhangi very rightly like said initially we were to do a fresh tisa tisa on the on day the of pick up itself right yes. now we don't yes. depends upon the patient's indication now suppose if he's severe ovt so many a time on the day of the pick up the multifocal puncture from different sites also never used to give us anything so we were in a panic mode so at that time what we used to do was to preserve check it prior and preserve it but the problem lies that the tisa tisa samples compared to the ejaculated sperm are very sensitive because they are younger in age so they are more prone to cytological damage actually even when we used to go by the sperm slow freezing there were various programs freezing for testicular sperm freezing for epididymal sperm and freezing for ejaculated sperm because the freeze pattern or the trauma induced during the freeze was actually programmed depending upon the consistency or the physiology of the sperm present at that time so it is easy to freeze an ejaculated sperm fantastic recovery but to recover a testicular sperm or an epididymal sperm post our normal vapor freezing method is totally a big limbo unless and until they are freeze very meticulously in controlled freezer with a very controlled drop rate of temperature the recovery of tisa pisa sperm now suppose he is obstructive azeus permit tisa pisa of course will definitely give a better quality of the sperm because the cohort is better so uh, depending upon the indications depending upon the chance when you are you may or may not get a sperm on that fruitful day this procedure or as a backup cryo freezing was essential correct so shubhangi is the vitrification uh, preferred method there for the uh, tisa sperms and uh, second question is that after recovery after the thawing process you know do you get all the motile sperms even with the tisa and even if you don't get the motile sperms are you getting the same results with non motile ones so uh i would like to say that when we freeze uh, there is only adding of the cryoprotectant and the cryoprotectant here that they use is the egg yolk based okay. so maybe that is the difference and uh, post uh, thaw we like i said we most of the times will do a density gradient uh, uh, and uh, we would use so what they do over your a uh, very peculiar uh, style that i thought was that they make droplets around in the exi dish a uh, really very tiny droplets around on the circular uh, side of the exi dish where that is post processed tisa pisa sample is uh, the sperms are put in and then it is called the inoculation of the sperms in the exi dish and the sperms are left in the incubator for around uh, at least 20 25 30 minutes for them to that is at 37 degrees otherwise all the sperm preparation over here is done at room temperature sperms are never exposed to 37 degrees come what may however even if the sample is viscous syringe is not passed so it's slightly a different uh, way of working so the inoculated droplets will definitely have a uh, good sperms which have uh, gained motility at 37 degrees and uh, being there for around 35 to 40 minutes and any, then you generally pick it up and do the x ray add any pentoxifiling theophylline no not at all fine no. but shubhangi no. i think majority of the time the testicular sperm are quite poor in motility the max they can show is a active propulsion twitching they they would only twitch exactly, ah, exactly. and they yeah. would also they would also have many a times kelsey they would have a collar around it the cytoplasmic complex is not yes, yes. even out because in because a testicular the cytoplasmic sperm is, yeah because in a testicular be, in a testicular sperm the only thing well developed is the acrosome properly right all right. the other mechanics of the yes, mid piece yes. and the tail are very underdeveloped Right. So that is a little twitching. Yes. Now this twitching, so we think about that the membrane integrity is intact. It is twitching, so better filter that person out. Correct. That's logic. So pick that, pick that, or otherwise also like uh, you know we used to do in the classic old days. If you don't find any motile sperm, then you do this breadstick uh, test. 
So yeah, me mechanical or a laser shot. You just no, no not no, a. We don't use laser, laser for sperm, but the breadstick test. What I mean is, just when you select a sperm, put put your injection needle on top of it and try and twitch the tail. If, like Kersi says, the plasma membrane is good, exactly. the membrane uh, is functional, then and it is pliable, you will find uh, that the tail is going to be twitching in a particular uh, angle. Otherwise, if it is a dead sperm, however much you uh, tap the injection pipette on the tail, it will still go down flat straight, which means that the sperm is non, non viable. So. That's a good Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I guess, uh, can I add one point here? Yeah, sure, Jackie. Yeah, uh, my uh, point on this is that uh, when whenever uh, I used to freeze the testicular uh, tissue, uh, we prefer not to tease it and to prepare it. We try to freeze it as such so the post or recovery is uh, probably much better than the processed one. Second uh, thing is the the it previously I used to do it like this that we used to do TISA a day before and uh, just keep them for culture for overnight or for some few hours so that we definitely get some motiles from out of non motile cohort. And nowadays, this is uh, what Shubhang is saying, which is one of the preferred technique that you just feel the tail flexibility and then you just uh, make an assumption that, okay, this, is, uh, this might be the motile sperm. But I still feel that it has to be done well in advance and sufficient time should be given for a culture. So we definitely get motiles from out of it. And uh, uh, you raised one thing about stickiness of the tissue, but not only tissue, the sperm is also sticky. So you need to be very meticulously handling the sperm. Sometimes uh, uh, they get stick inside your injecting pipette. So you, you, you probably might have to use a slightly wide borer prepared for testicular sperm because they have abnormal head, they have abnormal collar, neck. So these are the points which I just want to mention. Yeah, and I just interrupt. It all depends upon, first of all, why we are doing a testicular biopsy. When the count is less, when the count is OAT. Now, when the count is OAT, motility is out of question. Now, we are just having a twitching motion. So we don't expect the sperm to come about and swim about. So that is the challenging part in recovery post thaw because of course, as the cytology states that 25 to 30% of the fact, percentage of the cell frozen will not show good recovery. That depends upon the ideal cell stage at which they are frozen. And we all know that that ejaculated sperm are older by 30 to 35 days than the epididymal sperm or the testicular sperm. So the maturity is not ideal in itself. So when we freeze the tissue tubule as such, the functionality or the kinetics of the tissue freezing will be different from the freezing of the sperm. This makes them more sensitive. So hence the recovery, according to my experience, recovery of testicular tissue frozen by the vapor freezing method is, I'm sorry to say, bad. Right. That's true. Is Parag there? Is Parag there? Yes. Right. yes, actually, I, I need to. Okay, okay, no problem. Um, the last yeah. part of this uh, the session. So, what is the role of sperm freezing in the embryo, embryo you know, genesis? Because nowadays, it, it is really playing a crucial role. So, please explain this part of the uh, sperm freezing. Yes, uh, this sperm freezing is kind of a, a insurance nowadays in in part ED treatment in ART. Uh, in ART bank, I would first uh, like to mention, like the in ART bank, though, we, uh, due to the, you know, we cannot take the replacement replacement donation and uh, need to freeze the sperm. And nowadays, the ART bank is the only way we can get sperm uh, for uh, sperm, you know, donation program. Uh, so in those cases, we need to uh, freeze the sperm uh, for a long time, at least six months. The window period of uh, because the serology and the HIV, HBV, HCB, all those tests need to be done again, and then we can, uh, you know, free that particular sperm for sale. So this this particular uh, ART bank sperm donation is the uh, sperm, uh, you know, freezing is the key. Uh, it's playing key role, and for ART uh, patients as backup, as we all do in IUI, IVF, whatever we do. 
we do pulling or something, anything. So uh, no, we we are nowadays uh, from. I mean, uh, whenever I started my practice uh, decades back, at that time also we started that thing like the we need needed to freeze that particular sperm as backup so that the, on that particular day of pickup or on the day of IUI or IVF, the procedure, whatever the procedure, ERT procedure is going to happen on that particular day, if the uh, husband uh, is, uh, you know, cannot be present over there or they fail due to anxiety uh, related issue, which generally we face, uh, if they fail to uh, give semen and on that particular day, I, uh, we needed to, you know, freeze as backup uh, uh, the sample, sperm sample. Otherwise, uh, you know, you need to now, now another procedure is like that we can freeze the egg. Anyways, that is a, another subject. But uh, history of semen collection failure that we always uh, try to mention and we keep in every patient as backup for on the, uh, for the IUI or IVF or ECD day or to avoid as uh, Dr. Shubhangi and Dr. Casey um, uh, elaborated on that particular thing, like the azuspermia patient, azuspermic patients, you know, uh, uh, to avoid the need to, for repeat biopsies or aspiration, we can have the backup, uh, you know, uh, before uh, the pickup day or, you know, uh, long before whatever Dr. Charu said, like the, it's an interesting thing, like the one uh, night before, uh, one day before. So uh, so that is another procedure and we do for the uh, semen uh, freezing. Now the vasectomy insurance, as I mentioned, if surgical re reversal fails, you know, in many times, 20% in US figure, I have given 20% vasectomized men desire future children. In those cases, uh, before vasectomy, they can go for uh, semen freezing, sperm freezing. Another procedure like that, the medical freezing, that the term, I, I have got this kind of term, they, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Before, before starting any malignancy treatment, in our country also, we always, uh, you know, prefer like the, any chemotherapy or radiotherapy uh, that is cytotoxic, we know uh, in nature. Hence, before starting any such therapy, sperm freezing can be done as a reproductive insurance. Success rate is highly promising. But uh, uh, the but in other diseases also like Klinefelter syndrome, uh, we uh, use this kind of medical freezing. Now uh, you see that the obese men in that case they are saying that this term is uh, fitting like the uh, medical freezing because uh, obese men anyways you know uh, after some time in the you know with age uh, they if they cannot maintain their BMI uh, this farm uh, you know go quality goes down. So they better uh, go for sperm freezing. Even in sex reassignment surgery, uh, in nowadays it is becoming very popular in some places of world. So uh, this kind of surgery before that they can go for it. And age-related fertility decline, that is another medical, because the social sperm freezing, what we say, the ambiguity in categorization uh, like the social sperm freezing or the, it is a medical need because the age related uh, decline of sperm quality is a real issue and it's a medical issue. So the, the term is medical freezing uh, this uh, particular thing and working place has it like firefighters, farmers or soldiers because they, they are working in a very extreme conditions uh, due to their job. Uh, style so they they uh, better they go for sperm freezing and uh, this particular sperm freezing technique is a revolutionized uh, technique in case of uh, male uh, gametes now uh, the other uh, particular thing i would like to highlight like the available techniques what we are using like we have already elaborated but i would just give a gist of like the slow freezing it's a old, age old technique that the manual or automatic using you know same programmable freezer so two to four hours the time that was 1966 first done but uh, the uh, the gold standard which we have been the classical one that is the rapid freezing and vapor freezing technique that uh, that was uh, you know worked in 1990 the first pregnancy and that uh, particular technique we have been uh, you know using from long time 
Now, uh, now the vitrification technique, I'll come to the cryobism of small numbers of sperm reserve, but the vitrification technique is a novel, very new standardized technique, initially used in 1938 by Lucet, but for the frog sperm, but a healthy uh, birth using a vitrified sperm sample was recently reported in Spain after day five blastocyst transfer, uh, that is in 2019. Uh, so that vitrification technique is uh, now really promising. It is a novel technique and it's really uh, working good in uh, case of sperm vitrification. Now the cryopreservation of small numbers of sperm reserve is a real headache uh, for all of us, uh, because the, if, if the sperm numbers are very few, it is very difficult, really difficult uh, to you know, keep those particular sperm viable on the, for the day of uh, procedure. So uh, storage of individual spermatozoa in animal or human empty zona pellucida is a, is a you know, very old technique, but it's a very, uh, really good technique. Uh, storage of spermatozoa in ICP pits are being used also individual spermatozoa deposited directly on cryoprotectant film covering the nylon loop or the any other loop and immersed in liquid nitrogen. That is also another procedure and the sperm VD that that is a, we have revolutionized uh, this particular gadget this uh, small very small thin gadget which you uh, which you can uh, use to keep very very minimal number of sperm inside it and we can directly freeze and thaw in the you know uh, in the ICSI dish and we can take out very uh, small numbers from under the guidance of microscope so it's kind of a, a very uh, prefer taking nowadays. So uh, nitrogen free control rate freezing is nowadays uh, has uh, you know popularized it's uh, there are I'll go to the next slide yes slow uh, so this particular nitrogen free control rate freezing is a very uh, interesting one because that it, you don't need the nitrogen uh, uh, for the procedure. Uh, there are uh, some you know, the machine is costly, investment costs are higher for the apparatus, but running costs are only 1% in comparison to with classical liquid nitrogen freezing because liquid nitrogen is, uh, you know, the cost is uh, getting cut uh, for this, for using this particular technique. Now the slow freezing, as I was saying, like the efficacy, the time consuming, some authors argue that conventional slow freezing, either manual or automated, uh, you know, uh, cause, uh, causes extensive chemical physical damage to the sperm, uh, probably because of ice crystallization. But rapid freezing that I have saved, the paper freezing with club with paper freezing, relatively fast and widely used technique globally. This technique has some drawbacks as well uh, because the low reproducibility, indeed the temperature drop curve cannot be controlled and the freezing temperature may vary from minus 70, minus 80, minus 19 and whatever. I mean, the, 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 uh, the gap between the liquid nitrogen, uh, you know, liquid nitrogen and the uh, place where you are hanging that particular one, uh, the vial. So on that particular uh, thing, depending on that particular thing, uh, the temperature uh, varies. So uh, this is the one, one thing only, but cryopreservation of small numbers of sperm as well, as I say that in cryptojuspermia or surgically retrieved sperm in tesa pesa or TZ, this technique is preferred and gives good survivability, whatever the method used, but we need to keep in mind that to obtain good result, it is essential to correctly perform that particular technique before and after crab reservation because thawing is very, very, very important. Uh, but but I would rather say, uh, I conclude my uh, thing with one thing like that, uh, we have been thriving like the, which one is the good way of, you know, sperm selection. I would rather say the freezing and thawing is a very good way of sperm selection because only good quality of sperm only survives after uh, thawing. That is the, uh, that is the, um, uh, you know, uh, thing I would rather uh, say like this, what, whatever we are using, it is for good. I mean, the sperm freezing and thawing would give you, give you the, uh, good sperm because that sperm only survive because that sperm has having the integrity uh, to survive. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. I think uh, let us uh, summarize it. Uh, Charota, can you give some concluding remarks? Yeah, definitely. I think it is a wonderful session today. What we had starting from the uh, 
collection of the semen from the psychological issue to the basic and advanced method of the sperm preparation and the sperm selection method i think we have covered all the you know important tips of the male infertility what we uh, do it, uh, day to day in our uh, art laboratory to improve and at the most we all work for the you know better outcome and for the healthy life baby but so for that i just thank you dr kc parab charu ji vijay everyone uh, shubhangi akash and uh, aihera for giving us opportunity for this wonderful uh, moderating this wonderful session and my special thanks to dr vijay who has done a uh, good you know by dividing the work and uh, everything went very smoothly thank you so much thank you very much charada thank you for supporting me like this yeah. and all the panelists you did excellent and wonderful job i think this is a panel yeah. that will go a long way in remembrance and all the people all and the delegates will definitely would have enjoyed it thank you very much thank you, thank thank you, you so thank much you. Thank, thank you so much everyone thank you so much on behalf of i hera and jaidas kadila i thank you all of you for giving us the time and it was such a wonderful panel discussion you know that time is uh, overshooting now <laughs> but now but we are still i am in my office chamber only Lab yeah chamber. <laughs> i can see i can see i can see so it was very good thank you so much thank you everyone thank you so much thank you, thank you so much thank you bye thank you ma'am good night thank you so much uh, all hi shubhangi thank you bye 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 thank you, bye. Thank you very thank much you, thank you. hi charu hi hello after a long time we should meet now physically ha ah, bilkul bilkul yeah ab arrange karte hain kuch kare 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 ha abhi hum live nahi hai na ji dipak ji <laughs> <laughs> we are still live ma'am we are still live we are still live regard regards yeah. to uh, dr ratna ma'am ha uh. yeah <laughs> where are you at you are in uk or you are uh, planning to come right now i am in uk i will be here for some time then let's see i have not planned anything really okay each day each good. day as it comes <laughs> very good we should live in present only <laughs> yes yeah <laughs>